May 1780. The War of Independence now enters its fourth year, longer than anyone had imagined. Battle after battle has failed to bring either side closer to winning. In the North, where the revolution began, the war has ground to a deadlock. But in the South, the fighting has just begun. With their victory in Charleston, South Carolina, the British set grander sights toward establishing authority across all the southern colonies. The colonies here would be a handsome prize for King George. It is a land rich in lucrative crops like tobacco and rice, and by all accounts, full of colonists loyal to the crown. The British expect to find little resistance. Here, at last, they would find colonists loyal to the king and eager to embrace the British Empire, especially for its protection and trade. By moving south, they were moving to an area where they hoped that they could finally restore British authority and uh, put the loyalists in charge. The goal was always to try to isolate the rebellion. Uh, the assumption was that most colonists, given the chance, would be loyalists. For four years, the British have tried to find those colonists loyal to the crown. For four years, they have encountered an America deeply divided. But now, down south, they believe they have their strongest foothold. The south needs England, and England needs the south. They will drive their strategy toward the back country. Into this frontier, the British send one of their most effective and ambitious officers, Colonel Bannister Tarleton. He is destined to become a household name in the South, only it will not be for bravery, but for brutality. Tarleton is known for his daring, for moving his cavalry quickly, and the troops, quick hits. He's also known for just, for no restraint. He's a little bit of a dandy, which was appropriate for that era, but he fights like a Tasmanian devil. The British will not only raise and train a loyalist militia to keep peace in the South, they will hunt down rebels and destroy them. No one is better suited to that task than Tarleton. 100 miles from the coast, he closes in on the remains of the Continental Army in retreat from their defeat at Charleston. With great speed and agility, Tarleton's British cavalry catches up to a regiment of 350 Continentals under the command of Colonel Abraham Buford. He pursues them to a town called Waxhaws. Tarleton sends Buford a deadly threat. You are now encompassed by a corps of 700 light troops on horseback. Half of that number are light infantry with cannon, the rest cavalry. Bannister Tarleton, British officer. It's a bluff. Tarleton has no more than 200 men. But they are his best soldiers, well trained in the bayonet and saber. Buford, sure that he has the greater numbers, doesn't back down. Sir? I reject your proposals. I shall defend myself until the last extremity. Colonel Abraham Buford. Fire! Buford's words will prove prophetic. The Americans are able to fire just a few volleys before they are overrun. But Tarleton doesn't stop there. As the rebels raise the white flag of surrender, he continues a ferocious attack, cutting down enemy soldiers even as they lay down their arms. It will soon be remembered as the Waxhaws Massacre. Our captain attempted to defend his head with his left arm until the arm was hacked off. 
His head was then laid open to the eyes. Continental Soldier. Waxhaws is a painful loss for the Americans. But they will turn their defeat into another kind of victory on the propaganda front. The Battle of the Waxhaws is used by patriot propagandists to depict the British as monsters who will massacre their soldiers in a dishonorable fashion and ride roughshod over the countryside. Any occupying force trying to subdue a rebellion on the home soil of an insurgency is going to operate at a disadvantage when it comes to the propaganda war. Waxhaws will be remembered and used as a battle cry against the British. It sets the tone for the divisive war coming in the backcountry. Bannister Tarleton receives a reprimand from his superiors, but they do little else to rein him in. The man now known as Bloody Ban continues deeper into the backcountry, where the British are about to dig themselves an even bigger hole. In an effort to shore up loyalty and frighten would-be rebels, the British issue an ultimatum to Southerners. All persons who shall neglect to return their allegiance to His Majesty's government will be considered as enemies and rebels and treated accordingly. In most parts of the country and in most years of the revolution, uh, people had been able to stay out of the way, at least partially. But now it was uh, do or die. The severe proclamation is the work of Sir Henry Clinton, the overall commander of the British forces in America. Clinton should have known better. Back in 1776, the British issued nearly the same document in New Jersey, banking on strong loyalist sentiment. It backfired then, and it will backfire now. The verity here, if there is one, is if you're going to push someone off of the fence, you ought to be pretty certain which side of the fence they're going to fall on. Now, everyone must choose, for or against, loyalist or patriot. Old rivalries and fresh wounds inform their choices. The British have created a tempest in a teapot. The loyalists who do come out to join the fight for the king do so for their own agendas. And they will soon be met by an equal force equal in number and violence of patriots. A hornet's nest is stirred in the south, unleashing a fight that looks less like a revolution and more like a civil war. The British Army now moves deeper into the Carolina backcountry. Having declared, in a misguided proclamation, anyone not a friend, an enemy, they intend to back up their words with force. But resistance is deeper than they think. Late June, 1780. British Commander Sir Henry Clinton has lived in Charleston for a month now and can sense trouble brewing in the wilderness. His response? Leave for New York and turn the Southern Command over to another officer. London, England. The man who will replace Clinton is no stranger to the American war. General Charles Cornwallis will soon return to the colonies but a changed man. 
he has been in England to bury his beloved wife. Now, with her passing, Cornwallis can think only of escaping his memories, going back to the one place he hopes will be a tonic for his grief. He is devastated. And like many men, throws himself back into his work. In Cornwallis's case, it was the work of fighting the war. Whether he wins or loses in the colonies is no longer the point. I am now returning to America, not with views of conquest and ambition. Nothing brilliant can be expected in that quarter. But I find England quite unsupportable to me. It has now no charms for me. I must shift the scene. But Cornwallis will find the war in America changed too from how it had been fought up north. The British forces on the ground are moving further and further into unknown territory. A wild country made up of remote farms simmering with rivalries. This is not the south of wealthy ports and rich rice farms. This is the south of fetid swamps and untamed frontiers. Here, loyalties are not so clear. Those who might be loyalists, like everyone in this backcountry frontier, harbor grudges the British don't understand. Decades of land disputes and old animosities carried to the New World by each successive wave of immigrants have poisoned the territory. We need our family. All it takes is the presence of war to seriously stir things up. The South soon crawls with men like David Fanning, a struggling farmer, he had been robbed of everything he had two years back by a group claiming to be patriots. Now, with a powerful British mandate to ride under, he devotes himself to vengeance. Fanning also gathers more like him. Loyalist militia swarm over the backcountry with their campaign of terror. They are less interested in the outcome of the revolution than in the chance to pillage and grab land from their patriot neighbors. I heard the horses coming in such a furious manner, but I'd no time for thought. They were up to the house, entered with drawn swords and pistols in their hands, crying out, where'd these rebel women? Then they began to plunder the house of everything they thought worth taking. Eliza Wilkinson. Patriots soon join the fray. Men like Thomas Sumter, a former Continental soldier, take up their arms to battle the Loyalists. Stirred out of what he hoped would be retirement, Sumter gets back into the fight for personal reasons too. His house had been targeted by Loyalists. For him, as with men on both sides, the cause of independence takes a back seat to payback and plundering. In the South, it's American against American. There are entire battles fought. In fact, there are 103 different battles in South Carolina alone where there's nary a Brit in sight. This is Tory militia against, against uh, Patriot militia. Each side attempts to outdo the other in terror and brutality. Quipping, tar and feathering, and a particularly gruesome device called the spigot becomes as commonplace as revenge. A loyalist was placed with one foot upon a sharp pin and turned around. As cruel as this punishment might seem to those who never witnessed the unrelenting cruelties of the loyalists, I viewed the punishment with no little satisfaction. Charles Gibson, Southern Patriot. When the blood started to flow, it was revenge and counter-revenge. One killing provoked a counter-killing. It really tapped into these pre-revolutionary resentments and conflicts. It's like a fire feeding itself. It is, in short, a civil war.
The entire strategy was failing for Cornwallis and the British, producing not peace and order, but chaos and retribution. What happened to Cornwallis in the South is a long and bloody guerrilla war that had by that time made it extremely dangerous for anyone to reveal he was a loyalist. This was not the way warfare was supposed to be conducted, what people called the dogs of civil war. This was the way wars were fought in the southern backcountry. Cornwallis must rethink the very premises of his campaign. Forget the loyalists and their private wars. Attack the rebels where it counts most, the army. Cornwallis is a man utterly devoid of self-doubt. He really becomes convinced that he can lick the remainder of the Southern Department of the Continental Army. So he engages what's essentially a headlong rush to complete the annihilation of this force. From his headquarters in New Jersey, General George Washington realizes he must respond. He prepares to fortify the army in the South with new troops, and more importantly, with a new commander. But the man he wants to lead the Continental Army in the South is snubbed by Congress. Instead, the Continental Congress will send their man. They turn to General Horatio Gates, the hero of Saratoga, to head up the Southern Campaign. George Washington is furious. They have chosen one of his greatest rivals and a general he considers inferior. But for now, Washington can do nothing to stop an unfolding disaster. In the Carolinas, civil order crumbles as patriots and loyalists battle each other. In July, Congress scrambles to form and equip a southern army. At its head, against the advice of George Washington, Congress sends General Horatio Gates. Gates was the hero of Saratoga three years earlier when he defeated General John Burgoyne in the largest British surrender of the war. Yet there are whispers some say he stole credit for Saratoga from Benedict Arnold and Daniel Morgan. That he is not the great general he claims to be. Gates, ever proud, ignores the doubters and focuses on his grand ambitions. Horatio Gates wanted to be commander-in-chief of the American army. And it's, it's much, it goes much beyond that. Uh, whoever was the victorious leader of the revolutionaries, would, the emer would emerge as the leader of a new nation. There had to be a new ruler, some new kind of ruler. No one had decided what yet. Um, I think he might have been that ambitious and that foolish. But the challenges of the South still await him. Gates will soon take charge of an army in a dire state. He will inherit 1,400 soldiers still reeling from the defeats at Charleston and Waxhaws. I have, says Gates, an army without strength and a military chest without money. In the barren swamplands of South Carolina, Gates's army of professional soldiers slowly starves. They are as short on provisions as they are on the will to fight. Gates does little to alleviate their conditions. His soldiers, many of whom have been in the army since the outset, turn even more bitter. Being again disappointed, fatigued, and almost famished, their patients begin to forsake them. Their looks begin to be vindictive. Mutiny was ready to manifest itself. Colonel Williams. But Gates will soon get relief. The Patriot militia, who have been fighting their own wars in the backcountry, now turn out to fight alongside the army. What they lack in experience, they make up for in spirit. The militia are itching to take on the British. And General Gates thinks they can. 
The Continental soldiers, now in the minority, are less sure. They foresee trouble. We soldiers cannot imagine how an army consisting of more than two-thirds militia, and which had never once been exercised in arms together, could perform in the face of an enemy. Colonel Williams. Gates will mount his campaign against Cornwallis, ready or not. Faith in his militia, and in himself, is in an all-time high. Gates has still been stung by assertions that he doesn't really deserve the credit for the victory at Saratoga. He sees an opportunity to silence his critics and show them once and for all that he, in fact, is the best and most experienced American battlefield commander and that he can beat the British, whether on the defensive or on the offensive. Gates's chance comes sooner than he imagines. On August 16th, the two armies stumble upon each other at Camden, South Carolina. Each side hastily sets up for a battle. 5,000 British move into position, where they will meet Gates's 3,000 men. General Gates sends his militia out front, where they get their first taste of the best trained army in the world. But his audacity has caused him to make a serious tactical error, one with dire consequences. Gates places the militia on the left of his line, a position for which they are ill-prepared. The British Army will always put its best units at the right of its line, which is the place of honor. From the British perspective, the British have their best regiments facing off against the weakest and most ill-prepared American regiments. The best of the British is led by none other than Bloody Ban Tarleton, the butcher of Waxhaws. He now leads a fierce bayonet charge into the militia. Can't you imagine them just standing there and watching this line of red coming at them, you know, Hazain and presenting 18 inches of cold steel coming at them. Fear fuels confusion on the battlefield. They are fighting a losing battle. Almost immediately, the militia panic, break, and run. Out of the blood. He who has never seen the effect of panic upon a multitude can have but an imperfect idea of such a thing. The best disciplined troops have been made cowards by it. Colonel Williams. But they do not flee alone. Fast overtaking them is General Horatio Gates himself. The general who came south to gain glory now takes off on his horse as fast as possible as far as it will carry him. What began as a rather courageous venture now turns into a flight for his life, and he rides his 200 miles all the way back to Hillsborough without stopping and becomes the butt of every mean-spirited joke in the Continental Army for the next two years. I think he went into a complete panic. The situation was just too much for him. Alexander Hamilton praised him on his ride to safety. He said, it's quite remarkable for a man of his age <laughs> to have ridden so far so fast. The Battle of Camden scars Gates' reputation forever. It similarly tarnishes the army, and in particular, the militia. Few now believe the Patriots can hold the South, even though the future of the Revolution depends on it.
The defeats at Camden and Waxhaws have decimated the continental southern divisions. Of the 3,000 troops who marched at Camden, over half have been killed, captured, or wounded. The majority of the Patriot militia simply disappear back into the wilds. The South has all but fallen to the British. In New Jersey, George Washington soon receives news of the defeat at Camden. Washington feared the worst when Congress appointed Horatio Gates, and the worst has happened. Gates will face court-martial. But there is a more urgent concern. Who will now lead Washington's Southern Army? It's after Gates's debacle at Camden that Washington is finally allowed to send the man he wants. And of course, he goes to Major General Nathaniel Greene. I can venture to introduce this gentleman to you as a man of abilities, bravery, and coolness, George Washington. Nathaniel Green is Washington's most trusted subordinate. A New England patriot and fallen Quaker, Green has proven time and time again to be one of the most brilliant commanders in the Continental Army. Truly one of America's great generals, and nobody knows who he is. Washington says, if I'm shot in battle, if I can no longer take command, the general I want to lead is Nathaniel Green. Among the many qualities that recommended Nathaniel Green to George Washington was his can-do attitude. All military commanders want subordinates that will never admit defeat, that always say they can find some way to accomplish the mission. Green will travel far from his native New England to take on this formidable command only to find an army ravaged and dispirited. I am removed from almost all my friends and connections and have to prosecute a war with almost insurmountable difficulties. I cannot contemplate my own situation without the greatest degree of anxiety. Nathaniel Green, Continental General. Only 800 are deemed fit for duty. The rest, Green reports, are literally naked, starving with cold and hunger. In letter after letter, Green beseeches the 13 colonies for supplies and troops, to no effect. He begins to fear mutiny. It is impracticable to preserve discipline when troops are in want of everything. Be assured that you raise men in vain unless you clothe, arm, and equip them properly for the field. Nathaniel Green. Green and the Southern Army have all but been abandoned. He will attempt to supply his troops through local sources. But there is a threat more urgent than starvation. Cornwallis is on the march. Green needs a strategy and a miracle to keep his army from total destruction. The fortune Green needs soon arrives in the form of Colonel Daniel Morgan, one of the most courageous and unusual officers the Americans have. Morgan's past is cloaked in mystery, and he never speaks of it. By age 17, he appears as part of the British Army during the French and Indian War. By then, he is already a rough and scrappy boy, hardened from a backwoods frontier life. By nature, he is a fighter and carries scars from every brawl and knockdown, including 500 lashes for punching his superior officer in his early days. From then on, Morgan becomes the stuff of patriot legend. He really is a roughneck frontiersman, vulgar, hard drinking, hard fighting man. He really is the sort of stuff of fiction. But his rise through the ranks of the Continental Army is fact, 
a result of his enormous talent. Daniel Morgan would never have been made a general in the British Army. Morgan moves ahead because of ability. And, and he's a great example of the coming meritocracy. You don't have to be born into the gentry to be an officer. If you have the ability, if you have the, the stick to itness. By the time Morgan reaches the South, his hard earned reputation and his role at major battles like Saratoga gains him the respect of patriots and the resentment of the enemy. No one is better suited to fighting in the rough southern lands than Morgan. With Morgan now at his side, Green will enact one of the boldest and most irregular moves of the war. Green will split his army. Nathaniel Green adopts what it might be considered an unconventional approach to this war. He's going to break his force. He's going to divide it into something of flying columns, very mobile columns. He knows the British Army doesn't know the territory. And he knows that since they want to draw him into a decisive battle, he can lead them through the backwoods, through the marshes, into what are ultimately indecisive conflicts that's going to spread the British Army thin. Green and Morgan take off on separate paths. Green to the southeast, Morgan to the southwest. As if on cue, Cornwallis too splits his army, sending the infamous Tarleton after Morgan, while he himself pursues Green. The four flying armies, the prey and the predators, move through some of the roughest terrain on the eastern seaboard each following their own will to win. Cornwallis, Green, Tarleton, and Morgan, four ambitious and gifted leaders now engaged in a headlong chase. On the fringes of their armies, they skirmish. confirming over and over again the proximity of each other's troops. Yet Green and Morgan, with their lighter armies, move faster, avoiding a major battle. Instead, they draw the British deeper into the backcountry, further from supply lines and reinforcements. General Cornwallis, the British commander, grows more frustrated with each mile of rough terrain. The farther Green goes, the more intent Cornwallis becomes on catching him. He is going to chase Nathaniel Green all around the Carolinas, trying to gain that decisive battle. Green, knowing better than to engage Cornwallis on Cornwallis' terms, is not going to let Cornwallis catch up to him. As close as Cornwallis gets, Green is always able to stay one small step ahead of him. Be a little careful. And tread softly, for depend on it, you have a modern Hannibal to deal with in the person of Cornwallis. Daniel Morgan has his own nemesis to contend with, Bannister Tarleton and his ferocious regiment. Morgan knows he can't outrun them for long. Up north, far from the swamps of the south, the war for independence looks very staid. No armies engage, nor are battles fought. Here, the British and Continentals are at an impasse. In New York City, Sir Henry Clinton, the overall commander of the British in America, whiles away his time in luxury. There was a lot of going to dinner. He put on a lot of weight. There was a lot of inspecting the troops. Uh, all the things that a parade ground general, as uh, they were called, would do short of fighting. The war down south is far off. Clinton receives fewer and fewer dispatches from Cornwallis, but that doesn't concern him, at least not enough to leave New York City.
50 miles away in Hartford, Connecticut, another man with eyes on New York takes a meeting that he hopes will change the war. General George Washington hasn't seen a battle in a long while, nearly three years, but now his prospects may be changing. The French are in town, and Washington and his counterparts, the Marquis de Lafayette and Comte de Rochambeau, raise their glasses to a united front against the British. They toast with French wine, but it is France's navy that is on everyone's mind. Seven French warships sit in a Rhode Island harbor. Washington believes they are enough to launch an attack on New York and wrestle it back from the British. Rochambeau is more circumspect. A veteran of European wars, Rochambeau shows patience where Washington displays zeal. The French general prefers to wait for more reinforcements, much to the frustration of the Americans. Though these French ships sit idly in Newport, Rhode Island, the French have already tipped the balance of power in the war, but in less obvious ways. From an American perspective, the French Navy has not been that significant to this point in the war. The American perspective is a little bit biased and not very complete. In colonies and oceans all over the world, the French are taking on the British forcing them to fight a world war from the Caribbean to Cairo to Calcutta. The French Navy has helped extend the British Army and British Navy over a far wider expanse, indeed around the globe, when in the absence of the French Navy, the British were free to concentrate on North America. But the Americans don't quite see it this way. Washington sees only that he must delay his goal of taking New York. The battles, for now, remain in the South. January 16th, South Carolina. Daniel Morgan can no longer avoid confronting Tarleton's forces. Now, he must prepare to fight. On the eve of their battle, Morgan visits with his troops. Out of 600 men, more than half are militia. The same untrained forces that were last seen fleeing the field at Camden. Morgan's challenge? Make them engage. As he faces the most grueling battle of his life, Morgan rallies these citizen soldiers. Just hold up your head, boys. And when you return to your homes, how the old folks will bless you for your gallant conduct. Daniel Morgan. Morgan has great rapport with his troops. He loves to joke with them, to talk with them. I think they really just find him one of the great officers they've ever served under. He tells them things like, we'll have you home soon, boys, to kiss your girlfriends. January 17th. On a mild winter morning, the battle takes shape on a field known as cow pens. Here, Morgan puts into play his own new strategy, one of the most inventive of the war and most timely. Up to that point in the war, nobody had figured out how to use militia in a formal battle because they weren't trained to meet British regulars in a formal engagement. Morgan, he figures it out. Like others before him, Morgan puts his militia out front, the first line to meet Tarleton's charging British soldiers. Only this time, he tells them to fire just two shots, a quick volley, and then fall back. Against the onslaught of the British charge, they do just that. When the British see this, they think that they have earned a replay of Camden that they have essentially caused a rout of the militia forces who are breaking from the field. 
they will pursue a headlong rush and find themselves facing the very well-directed volley fires of Morgan's regulars. The result is predictable for Tarleton's Legion. Bannister Tarleton, the aggressive and ambitious young officer, drives right into Morgan's trap. The Continentals reply with alarming force. British infantry scatter and retreat. Tarleton will try to push them on again, but within an hour, the battle is lost. Tarleton has chased Morgan all across the South to end here, defeated by the rough and tumble American at Cowpens. Talk about a conflict of styles. You have this very sort of arrogant, dashing, cruel British officer, young guy, and Daniel Morgan. And they're both playing for keeps, you know? How can you not love that victory when um, Daniel Morgan just beats the tar out of Tarleton? Most of the entire British detachment at Cowpens is killed, captured, or wounded. This time, it is bloody Bannister Tarleton who is seen fleeing the field. He will escape, soon to rejoin Cornwallis's army, thirsting for revenge. It was Morgan's whim. Morgan had outplanned, outstrategized, and outled his counterpart. He had transformed his militia army at their moment of greatest need. But it will be the backcountry brawler's last battle. Morgan, all along, suffered quietly from painful back ailments and rheumatism. You could say, why is he retiring now? He's just won this big, monumental victory. And the real question is, how was he able to fight at all during the Battle of Cowpens? It's very painful for him. And his commanding officer, Nathaniel Green, says, you've earned the right to go home. Morgan, who had spent a lifetime of fighting, will now watch the war from a small farm in Virginia, from the sidelines. For Nathaniel Green, the chase is still on. Cornwallis is closing in, and with Tarleton again by his side, they will come at Green with everything they've got. The war in the South will go on, as bloody and vicious as ever but the stakes are rising. From the south to the north to across the Atlantic Ocean, everyone is asking the same question. How will this war end? And when? For everyone, time is running out on the American Revolution. January 27, 1781, New Jersey. The War for Independence drags into its sixth year. Money, spirit, and patience are flagging throughout the army. Time is running out. Only three weeks into the new year, the situation reaches a crisis point. The Continental Army, exhausted and neglected, is on the verge of revolt. In no time, Washington has mutiny on his hands. His response will be determined and drastic.
Unless effectual measures are taken to place the army upon a more satisfactory footing, its dissolution and the utter ruin of our cause will be the inevitable consequences. George Washington. The story of the mutiny began on January 1st in Morristown, New Jersey. There is little to celebrate this new year. The war has become an unrelenting misery. Soldiers from the Pennsylvania line reach their limit. Unpaid, underfed, and barely clothed, they can endure no more for the great cause. By 1781, the Continental Army has become, in many ways, the professional organization that Washington wanted and needed it to be. But it's an army that is unhappy. They haven't been paid in a long time. And when money has been forthcoming, it has been paper money that is depreciating moment by moment. It's worth less every day. The soldiers are quite clear about the fact that they are loyal to the cause, but they want the terms of their contract to be honored. Enraged, they voice their grievances to their superiors. But there is nothing to be done. Congress, without the right to tax, is out of money to pay its soldiers. The soldiers are not swayed. They see this as a series of broken promises. They pledged their lives. They are spilling their blood. They thought they were making a contract to serve their country. But the country isn't honoring the contract. The officers watch from the comfort of their quarters. Some are sympathetic, but others brush the soldiers' concerns aside. Suddenly, the ideas of the revolution, the talk of liberty and equality for all men, seem no longer to apply. I don't think the fact that the officers had better clothing, better food, um, better equipment, endeared them to the regular troops who were so cold and so hungry and so behind in their pay. Within the revolution, a rebellion grows. On January 2nd, camps empty as 1,300 soldiers, one quarter of the Northern Army, up and leave. They march out, taking cannon and weapons, with one destination in mind, Continental Congress, a two-day march away in Philadelphia. Their plan? Make Congress listen. They get as far as Princeton. They seize the town of Princeton. Washington sends an army to surround them there. And they negotiate a peaceful settlement. The troops who want to go home get their money. The troops who want to stay get the clothing they need. About half of them go home. And that's the end of it. Washington begs Congress for money and provisions as the only way to pacify his army. It is too little, too late. As I have used every endeavor in my power to avert the evil that has come upon us, so will I continue to exert every means to prevent an extension of the mischief. But I can neither foretell or be answerable for the issue. George Washington. Fresh unrest spreads among other camps. They, too, want what they believe they are owed. January 20th, 1781. Pompton, New Jersey. Now, 200 soldiers from the New Jersey line rebel. They, too, begin their march to Congress. But this time, Washington will strike them down. For the sake of the revolution, these mutinies must end. 
couldn't have an army where mutinies took place and hundreds of men left and went home. The army would implode and the war would be lost. Worse, any mutiny leads the British to believe that the army is collapsing and to renew their fervor to win the war. Washington's view is, that's it, enough's enough. The mutineers don't get far. All are quickly captured. The ringleaders are sentenced to death by firing squad. But they are not the only ones who will pay a heavy price for their insubordination. In a cruel move, Washington then gets their 12 closest friends, 12 men who were with them in the mutiny, but not quite the ringleaders, and orders them to shoot them. The men in the Jersey line are aghast at this. But at the same time, terrified. It could have been me. This was a most painful task. When ordered to load, some of them shed tears. James Thatcher, Continental Doctor. The first six men fire. they have deliberately aimed high, sending a volley over the heads of the condemned men. The second six are immediately assembled, and under penalty of death themselves, ordered to shoot. This time, the shots find their target. Punishment sends a clear message. Sedition will no longer be tolerated in the Continental Army. After the execution of those men in that terrible winter of 1781, there were no more mutinies. But the unrest in his army has shaken Washington. His authority and the revolution are slipping away. He must find a way to end this war, now. In the South, the war continues without pause, an ongoing showdown between two determined armies. Having surprisingly beaten the British at the Battle of Cowpen, the Continentals steady themselves for revenge. The British will seek to make an all-or-nothing push to annihilate the rebel force. General Charles Cornwallis, the British commander in the South, has become singular in his obsession. He will not stop until he can make the Continental Army stand and fight. Instead, the rebels keep pulling Cornwallis deeper into the backcountry. On a cat and mouse chase led by his arch rival, General Nathaniel Green. Cornwallis himself believes that if he can draw Nathaniel Green into one decisive fight, if he can bring this war to one pitched battle somewhere in the South, the battle's going to be over. Green won't give him that satisfaction. General Nathaniel Green knows better. He learned early on in battles like New York and Brandywine that keeping the army away from direct confrontation is paramount. Like a boxer who realizes his opponent hits harder, Green's plan is to keep moving 
to wear down and exhaust his enemy. If he can buy time, he can get reinforcements. Green draws Cornwallis step by step farther from his lines of supply, farther from the possibility of reinforcements, farther from the point of no return. Green has been leading a chase for months that zigzags across the south. Through swamp and forest, Cornwallis manages to stay close, often trailing by a few hundred yards. But the Continentals are like a mirage that disappears as he draws near. The two sides regularly skirmish amongst scouting parties. But the main armies never meet. Green's Continental Force is smaller, lighter, and faster. The British, by contrast, are encumbered. They will need to take extreme measures to keep up. To lighten his load, Cornwallis orders an enormous bonfire built, onto which all the unnecessary trappings of a distinguished British army are thrown. Wagons, tents, clothing, fine china, silver, and cask upon cask of rum. Cornwallis is very earnest. He does not want to allow Green to escape. He is going to do anything within his power to catch up to Green. In this situation, without baggage, necessaries, with zeal and bayonets only, it was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world. Brigadier General Charles O'Hara. It is a fateful decision that he will pay for later. The race picks up speed. The two armies begin to travel at an almost inhuman pace, moving as much as 40 miles in a single day. Green now sees only one chance for survival. As Cornwallis chases him toward the Virginia border, Green makes a daring move. He splits his army, sending one branch toward the upper Dan River, while the main army moves east, where Green has commandeered all the boats along the crossings. Cornwallis, fooled, dutifully follows the decoy. It bought Green the time he needed to move down the river to the point where the Continentals had gathered all of the boats on that river and crossed at a point that Cornwallis could not hope to cross. Green's plan works. He moves his entire regiment, all 2,000 men, across the Dan, reaching the other side just in time. The British, realizing the ploy, rush to the crossing, arriving just hours after the last of Green's boats leave. Cornwallis, so close to the victory he sought, recognizes that the chase is over. The cheers from the Continentals are so loud they can be heard across the river, a taunting sound to the British. But it is genuine joy. After marching more than 200 miles in just one month, Green's army can finally rest. Green will not stay in Virginia long. He will get what he needs, new supplies and new recruits, and change his game. The hunted will become the hunter. Here in the South and beyond, the tide is about to turn. Far from the swamps of the southern colonies, another chase drags on. France, 1781, the court of Versailles. The venerable diplomat Benjamin Franklin is still in hot pursuit of France's money. Lately, it has become elusive. King Louis XVI, America's ally against the British, has given more than $100 million in direct aid to the revolution. In fact, he's going broke funding the Americans. 
yet it never seems to be enough to satisfy Ben Franklin. Franklin gets these truly amazing shopping lists from Congress. They are requisition lists for everything from thimbles and shovels and thread and drums and paintbrushes to, oh, and by the way, 30,000 blankets and 50,000 uniforms, and a ship of the line would be nice, too. Fred is essentially constantly approaching them with his tin cup and being told, but we already gave at the office. You're being told we've already given you X. How can we possibly cough up more? Franklin is caught between two masters. On one hand, he must convince the French that the American Revolution can still be won. On the other, he must assure Congress that French aid, the key to the war, is on its way. Some Americans, like General Washington, have reason to doubt it. Washington was always confused and perplexed, and until the end, disappointed in the French. The soldiers that they did promise didn't get here fast enough. He didn't feel that there were enough of them. He's worried about the help that the French have given him, if it's going to be in time. Unbeknownst to Washington, his concerns are being answered. Quietly, on its own schedule and with its own agenda, the French Navy finally makes a move that will change the war. March 1781. On the eastern coast of France, a shipment is being prepared. The mighty French warship, the Ville de Paris, readies for a long voyage to the Americas. At its helm, the Admiral François-Joseph-Paul Comte de Grasse, one of France's most talented admirals and greatest glory seekers. De Grasse's stated mission is in the Caribbean, where France's critical trading interests lie. But if the timing is right, de Grasse plans to visit North America. After all, this is a war against the British, a cause beloved by all French. It's important to remember that France is in this conflict not to secure American independence. France is in this conflict to humiliate um, the British government to hopefully seize some territory from Britain and to slice off a major part of the North American empire from the British empire. America may be a pawn in this game between superpowers, but the rebels can still make their own luck. Their next moves will shape fresh opportunities for all sides. February 22, 1781. General Nathaniel Green pushes his players into position. He readies his army, now regrouped and resupplied, to cross back into North Carolina, where he will now seek the confrontation with Cornwallis he once avoided. Crossing again over the Dan River, Green soon draws Cornwallis back into the chase. Only this time, Green leads the desperate British commander toward a spot favorable to the Continentals. They will take the high ground at a small junction called Guilford Courthouse. March 15. Green sets his army first. Cornwallis, weakened from lack of provisions, nonetheless prepares to throw all he has left at winning. Cornwallis's men soon break through Green's militia lines. They bear down on the rest of the army with bayonets. The Continentals face the charge. The two sides fall upon each other at close quarters. A bloody melee fought hand to hand. Fearing loss, Cornwallis makes a desperate and brutal decision. Cornwallis turns to the lieutenant in charge of artillery and orders him to fire grape right into the mass of struggling men, both Americans and British, in order to break it up. The cannon cut down as many British as Americans but it is enough to stop the rebels. 
Green orders his men to retreat. He cannot and will not risk his soldiers. Cornwallis is victorious, but only by sacrificing his own men. Twice as many British die in the victory as Continentals perish in the loss. It is the kind of win that feels, ultimately, more like a defeat. The months spent chasing Green have cost Cornwallis greatly and gained him nothing. Defeat of the rebel army is not one inch closer to him. He will leave the Carolinas an ambiguous victor in search of more decisive battles. But he leaves the British strategy in tatters. Just at the moment, the Continentals and their French allies are about to move as one. Losses in the South and stalemate in the North have left the British command in America in disarray. Worse, public confidence back home is weakening. London, England, 1781. All of Britain is tiring of this increasingly unpopular conflagration, whose costs in money and human life continue to escalate. King George and his cabinet may try to spin it differently, but they cannot change the facts. The insurgent colonies are showing no signs of submission. The British people are saying, come on home, what's in this for us? They're wondering, how is this gonna end? How is this gonna play out? Or is this just gonna go on forever? The rift between those who wish to end the war fast and those who take the long view travels over the Atlantic. In America, the king's commanders will soon find themselves with opposing strategies of war. In New York, Sir Henry Clinton, the overall British commander, takes a patient view of things. It's easy for him, surrounded as he is by all the luxuries the colonies have to offer. Clinton has four houses that he lives in in New York. He's living pretty high on the hog, well supplied. Certainly his liquor bill is remarkably high. Found great enjoyment in the arms of Mrs. Badley, who was the wife of a um, British officer. I would guess it was hard for Clinton to leave New York. It was comfortable, it was loving, at least Mrs. Badley was. The way Clinton conducts the war from New York, it's almost like he's waiting for events to throw him an advantage that he can then act upon. Cornwallis's instincts are to act. Cornwallis's instincts are to fight them to death. Now, my dear friend, what is our plan? Without one, we cannot succeed. If we mean an offensive war in America, we must abandon New York and bring our whole force into Virginia. General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis pushes his contest into Virginia, but he is soon cut short. Clinton, opting for defensive wars, orders him to set up a protective base along the coast. This adventure through the south inland is not working. We need to make sure that we secure the kinds of bases, the footholds that will allow us um, to maintain our position in North America and fight another day. <laughs> Cornwallis has no choice but to obey his commander. He turns his army toward a small coastal village to a place called Yorktown. Once, Yorktown was known solely as a tobacco trading port. But it will soon become a major battlefield and for some, a place of destiny. July, the Caribbean. France's Admiral de Grasse makes his long-awaited appearance. 
the fall was hurricane season in the Americas. This is a time when, for the most part, shipping comes to a complete pause um, in the Caribbean. And so it's the right moment um, for de Grasse to leave the Caribbean and assist um, their allies in North America. I am sorry to see the distress in which the American continent finds itself. You can note the desire I have to provoke a change in your favor of the situation. Admiral de Grasse. The French Navy, thus far an absent player in the revolution, now turns north with 28 ships, 3,000 men, and long-awaited money to pay Continental soldiers. But they also come with a catch. It will be the French, not Washington, who decide where they will land. In their view, the British are weakest in Virginia, near the Chesapeake Bay, at the small port of Yorktown. Washington had his heart set on retaking New York, but when de Grasse says he's going to the Chesapeake, he's going to be there just for a certain time, Washington then makes really the greatest decision of his career. He knows, he seems to sense that this is the time. This is the time to strike. It may be declared in a word that we are at the end of our tether and that now or never our deliverance must come. George Washington. With all he has, every soldier, every cannon, every French reinforcement, Washington moves south. The general now returns to Virginia, his beloved homeland, in search of the battle he hopes will end the war. Washington breaks his stride just once as he rides ahead of his army on a mission of a more personal nature. For the first time since the beginning of the revolution, Washington visits his home. He goes home to Mount Vernon, and I think the whole point of the war is brought home again to him on a very personal level. He had seen Martha only rarely, and he had grown out of touch with Mount Vernon. Now he delves into the details that a man of the house, not the general of an army, would attend to. There is the ongoing renovation of Mount Vernon and the particulars of running a southern plantation. Six years ago, he left them behind to take charge of a rebellion that turned into a revolution, and a revolution that turned into a world war. Now, he longs for it to be over. This is what I'm fighting for. On one hand, and then on the other hand, it's, when can I get home? I'm fighting for this, but I want to be here so much. George Washington is not the only one who came into his own in these many years. Washington's only son, Jackie, had come of age too. Long kept out of the army by his overprotective parents, Jackie now makes a final plea to follow his father into battle. This time, Washington softens. It is a testament to Washington's confidence. With all good fortune, the end of the war is at hand. A convergence is taking shape. As Admiral de Grasse sails up toward Virginia from the Caribbean, the Continental Army, now joined by 5,000 French troops, also heads toward the Chesapeake Bay. There, General Cornwallis hastens to build his defenses at Yorktown. But he is beginning to feel that he is sitting at the center of a dangerous trap. Cornwallis raises the alarm. He writes to Clinton in New York. Sir, if I had no hopes of relief, 
I would rather risk an action than defend my half-finished defenses. But if you cannot relieve me very soon, you must be prepared to hear the worst. General Charles Cornwallis. Clinton's response? Vague promises. Your Lordship may be assured I shall endeavor to reinforce the army under your command by all the means within my power. Sir Henry Clinton. Cornwallis will soon find himself hanging on those promises, while Washington and the French will get their chance to fulfill the promise of alliance. For each player, the war's endgame has arrived. The Continental Army, after a year of deadlock and disloyalty, is now moving as one en route to Yorktown and the largest offensive of the war. America, fatigued after six years of fighting, holds its breath. Independence, their glorious cause, feels within its grasp once more. September 5th. Admiral de Grasse and his French fleet arrive first to the Chesapeake Bay and take on the inadequate British force sent to chase him out. The two navies clash at sea for four days. Both fleets are badly hurt, but it is the British who must give up the bay. They needed to drive de Grasse out of the mouth of the Chesapeake, and that they failed to do. De Grasse, in one pivotal battle, captures control of all that comes into or out of Yorktown. General Cornwallis knows his situation is worsening. He needs more help. He needs reinforcements. His commander, Henry Clinton, has not budged from New York. Sir Henry Clinton to Earl Cornwallis, New York. Your Lordship may be assured that I am doing everything in my power to relieve you, if the winds permit and no unforeseen accident happen. This, however, is subject to disappointment. Sir Henry Clinton. Earl Cornwallis to Sir Henry Clinton. Sir, I shall have no doubt if relief arrives in any reasonable time, York will be in the possession of His Majesty's troops. General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis, feeling magnanimous, takes faith in Clinton's tepid promises. Imprudently, he stays put. One by one, his routes of escape are cut off. De Grasse's ships inch up the York River. George Washington takes the south. French ground troops occupy the north and west. 17,000 French and Continental soldiers now surround Cornwallis. Washington presents his plan. Launch a massive frontal assault on Cornwallis. His European allies disagree. Yorktown has now become heavily fortified. Washington will lose a lot of men in the assault. General Rochambeau, the French commander, suggests a long-range siege of cannon and mortar. Washington sees it as a better strategy. One of his great gifts as a commander was to listen to other people and often do what other people suggested, even if he was against it at first. On October 6th, the siege begins. Trenches are dug that will, in time, envelop Yorktown like the tightening of a noose. Earl Cornwallis to Sir Henry Clinton. Sir, the enemy made their first parallel on the night of the 6th. On the evening of the 9th, their batteries opened and have since continued firing without intermission. Against so powerful an attack, we cannot hope to make a very long resistance. 
General Charles Cornwallis. A lot of a siege is about the timing. Can you force a city to surrender before the city gets reinforcements? Can you get closer and closer in your parallel trenches as you move towards the city lines of defenses? October 11th, the second parallel is dug, closing the circle around Yorktown. Still, there is no sign of Clinton's reinforcements. October 11th, 5 p.m. Since my last letter was written, we have lost 30 men. I have only to repeat, nothing but a direct move can save me. General Charles Cornwallis. Clinton promises support, and Clinton promises support, and Clinton promises support, and Cornwallis waits for the support, and he waits for the support, and it doesn't arrive. The siege daily is becoming more and more formidable. His Lordship Cornwallis must view his situation as extremely critical, if not desperate. James Thatcher, American officer. October 14th, 8 p.m. Washington's troops close in and make a full-scale attack on the outer redoubts of the fort. October 15th, Earl Cornwallis to Sir Henry Clinton. Sir, my situation now becomes very critical. The safety of this place is so precarious that I cannot recommend you run great risk in endeavoring to save us. General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis's letter will not be read. Clinton has already set sail from New York. But the belated relief effort will not be in time. His window has closed. For six long years, Washington fought a war marked more by loss than victory. Now his day has come. The general's finest hour begins quietly with a lone British drummer spotted coming through the smoke. The enemy beat a parley, and Lord Cornwallis proposed a cessation of hostilities to settle terms for the surrender of the posts. To this he was answered, that a desire to spare the further effusion of blood would readily incline me to accept of the surrender but that I wish to have it in writing. George Washington. When he got Cornwallis's letter proposing the secession of hostilities, uh, his heart must have been ready to burst because I think he must have known just as Cornwallis knew that was it. This was the end. To Sir Henry Clinton. Sir, I have the mortification to inform Your Excellency that I have been forced to surrender the troops under my command. I never saw this post in a very favorable light. General Charles Cornwallis. General Henry Clinton can barely contemplate the consequences of his inaction. He had set in motion the endgame and then sat idly while it played out. Now the Southern British Army is lost, and possibly the war itself. October 19th, 1781. Seven thousand redcoats lay down their arms in front of General George Washington. On this momentous occasion, only one person is missing. General Charles Cornwallis avoids the ceremony, claiming illness. No doubt he felt worse on this day than any other in his long military career. How could this have happened? Cornwallis is so 
uh, humiliated um, and so uh, stricken by the defeat that he cannot surrender in person to George Washington. October 27th, Cornwallis and Washington will meet a week later when Cornwallis, in a show of respect, invites Washington to his headquarters. What the two men discuss is not recorded, but surely they must have shared the same thought. Now they come together as equals, as the commanders from two nations, one ancient and powerful, the other on the verge of being born. For the Americans, certainly there are euphoric feelings of victory. Now though, the more difficult task of building a nation begins. Washington, the general, is about to exit the stage to make way for Washington, the statesman and nation builder, a challenge he cannot yet conceive. But before he can look to the future, Washington is pulled back into the present. Victory has come at a terrible price, a personal tragedy that will forever scar the general. During the siege, Washington's son, Jackie, who finally came to fight alongside his father, falls ill to a devastating camp fever. Washington and Martha arrive in time to see their son alive, but only briefly. Jackie soon dies, at the very last, a victim of America's crusade at Yorktown. At the same time, the country is celebrating in jubilation through all the colonies at the victory of Yorktown. The commander in chief who brought them that victory is mourning deep in grief over the death of his son and his final child. George and Martha have now lost all their children. It is the final, ultimate sacrifice for the Virginia farmer who stepped up to lead his fledgling country. At last, it seems the revolution is coming to an end. But Washington, like the thousands of Americans who fought and died alongside him, must wonder at the extraordinary cost of independence. October 1781, Tench Tillman, George Washington's aide, rides nonstop for four days and nights to bring glorious news from Yorktown, Virginia to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The Americans have decimated Britain's southern army and forced the surrender of its best general, Charles Cornwallis. This was a huge victory, over 7,000 people taken prisoner. There are great celebrations Illuminations, they call them, fireworks, ringing of bells, and so on. But the joy in Philadelphia is anything but unanimous. Loyalists face a different kind of illumination. They would not have imagined this house to be illuminated last night, but it was. A mob surrounded it, broke the shutters and the glass of the windows, and were coming in. It was the most alarming scene I ever remember. Anna Rawl, Loyalist Daughter. Paris, November 19th. A month later, as fast as 18th century news can travel, a midnight message is delivered to Benjamin Franklin with the news of Yorktown. Franklin has been in France for five years to secure and hold on to French support. At long last, victory and peace may be at hand. London, six days later, 
Ironically, the British are the last to know. Prime Minister Lord Frederick North gets the dreadful news by way of a French source. My God, he cries, it's all over. The news stuns England. The last anyone had heard, Cornwallis, one of Britain's most able generals, had marched his army from Charleston to Virginia uncontested. There's been no warning that such a profound defeat was even possible. The capture of Cornwallis comes as a nasty shock. Britain's not supposed to lose. And it's not supposed to lose to its own people, to its own colonists. King George III has no intention of surrendering any part of his empire. He prepares a speech to steal the spine of Parliament. The late misfortune calls loudly for your firm concurrence and assistance. I have no doubt but that by the support of my Parliament, by the valour of my fleets and armies, and by a united exertion of my people, I shall be enabled to restore the blessing of a safe and honourable peace to all my dominions. King George III. In New York, Britain's man in charge of the American war is still General Henry Clinton. His failure to reinforce Cornwallis at Yorktown has made his troubled command unbearable. I am fairly worn out. For God's sake, let me return to my little family while I have something of life left. General Henry Clinton. Henry Clinton makes a willing and ready scapegoat for this debacle. He has very few friends, legions of enemies. So back in England, immediately there are renewed calls to bring this war, at least against the Americans, to a speedy conclusion. While London weighs its next move, it orders Clinton to maintain all positions on the Atlantic seaboard. The British still have 12,000 troops in New York, 5,000 in Charleston, South Carolina, and over 1,000 in Savannah, Georgia. Britain still has substantial forces in North America, so no one is under any illusion that the war is over. Up in New Windsor, New York, Continental Commander George Washington has brought his 10,000-man army 60 miles up the Hudson River from New York to contain Clinton and his army. Washington's troops may be savoring their victory at Yorktown, but the general himself is not yet ready to celebrate. Because there is this exuberant feeling of victory that the Americans have won this great victory, a lot of the American soldiers at this point are inclined to hang them up and head back home and return to the business of peace. But the war is not yet over, and Washington recognizes this. Yorktown didn't end it. The British and the Loyalists in the Carolinas and in Georgia wouldn't lay their arms down. Once again, it falls to Rhode Island General Nathaniel Greene, Washington's second in command, to continue his guerrilla war in the South. With only a thousand men, Greene cannot hope to capture Charleston or Savannah, but he relentlessly attacks British outposts in the Carolina and Georgia backwoods, forcing British soldiers back to the cities. Green and his men never let up on the enemy in some of the bitterest fighting of the entire war. The fighting in the back country is continuing. There's fighting on the frontier and then skirmishing in other places. There are more American deaths at the end of the war than at the beginning. The war is not necessarily over. London, February 1782. The war in North America may not be over, but it has grown increasingly unpopular with England's people and politicians. 
The feeling among almost everyone is Cornwallis has been captured. This war has been expensive. It's been ruinous in terms of the loss of men. It's drawn us into uh, a fight where we have no friends, no allies in Europe or anywhere else. Parliament's war opponents are determined to quit North America. They introduce a motion that the war in America be brought to a close. Initially, the motion is defeated by one vote. But in a revote three days later, it carries by 19, effectively ousting Lord North and his pro war regime. The king is furious. Now, with the opposition in power, he must agree to end the war despite his firm belief that an independent America will weaken, perhaps destroy, his empire. He fumes, even contemplates resigning, as Parliament sets about the complex business of obtaining a workable peace. By spring, the major conflict moves from the battlefields in America to the peace table in France. Will Britain recognize American independence? What will the French demand for their contribution to the war? The future of America now rests on the shoulders of a negotiating team headed by the wise and cunning Benjamin Franklin. London, spring 1782. The six months of limbo after the American victory at Yorktown is starting to break. Parliament has voted to end the war in America and forced out its Prime Minister, Lord North. In New York, a worn-out General Henry Clinton gets his wish and is relieved of his command. He has been fighting this war nearly from the beginning, from Bunker Hill in 1775 to Yorktown. For the last four years, Clinton has served as Commander-in-Chief. His greatest moment was capturing Charleston in 1780. But he exits America forever tarnished by the catastrophic failure at Yorktown. Clinton's replacement, Sir Guy Carleton, the former Governor General of Canada, is charged with ending hostilities and withdrawing British troops. George Washington, ever wary, keeps his army alert and ready for any British action. From the former infatuation, duplicity, and perverse system of British policy, I am induced to doubt everything, to suspect everything. General George Washington. In Paris, peace negotiations begin somewhat tentatively in April. The Continental Congress has instructed the venerable Benjamin Franklin to sort through the many political agendas of the French, British, Spanish, and Dutch whose recognition America will need to secure its independence. Franklin is the one sitting in Paris when the peace feelers are first put forward. So it's his job to begin to separate the valid ones from the sort of less serious ones to find, figure out which emissary is really bearing negotiating power, which is not as easy as it sounds. But he holds this whole mess of peace feelers in place until he's joined in Paris um, by John Jay and ultimately by John Adams. John Adams is currently in the Netherlands seeking Dutch recognition of the United States and is soon to join Franklin at the Paris peace table. 37-year-old John Jay, a lawyer from New York and a former president of Continental Congress, is the youngest member of the American Peace Commission and plans to arrive in Paris by June. For now, Franklin is on his own, just the way he likes it. What Britain wanted out of negotiations more than anything else was to separate the United States from France because a persistent French-U.S. alliance would be a horrific prospect. Which is exactly what France is hoping for. France has a great stake in the outcome. Franklin's ally, French Foreign Minister Comte de Vergennes persuaded his king, Louis XVI, to declare war on Britain, his perennial enemy. Since joining the war in 1778, France has thrown its army and navy into the fight and has lent the Americans $31 million. 
Vergen is anxious for a satisfying payoff to his investment, American independence that will decimate England's wealth, trade, and power. The Continental Congress has ordered Franklin to operate under the guidance and instructions of the French court. Over the next several months in Paris and Versailles, the old chess master takes care with every move. Franklin knew that the cardinal rule of diplomacy was never to speak unless you absolutely had to. The patience of an old man, coupled with the fact that he's naturally taciturn, makes him an enormously shrewd diplomat. Innumerable issues need to be ironed out with the British. The big one, of course, is independence. But there are other crucial items for both sides. Terms of trade, fishing rights off the coast of Canada and on the Mississippi River, payment of pre-war debts. Who owns what North American territory outside the previous colonial borders? But no issue is more sensitive than the fate of the Americans who sided with the British the Loyalists. There was a great sense of obligation to the American Loyalists. And there was a sense that having expended so much effort and drawn the Loyalists into public professions of allegiance, Britons couldn't simply abandon their flesh and blood this way. They have to be evacuated because they fought on the wrong side. They see no life left for them. Who knows, their land is going to be confiscated probably. They may well be killed for fighting on the wrong side. July 1782, Savannah, Georgia. With hostilities brought to a halt by the peace talks, the exodus begins for those no longer welcome. Sir Guy Carleton, Britain's commander in chief, orders the evacuation of Savannah. As a thousand British troops sail for New York to join the main army, 2,500 white loyalists and 5,000 black slaves who joined the British set sail for British-controlled territory in Florida and the West Indies. A month later, in Charleston, South Carolina, the British post a general notice promising transport out for those who cast their lot with the crown. By the end of the year, Charleston will see 126 ships carry nearly 12,000 people, white and black, to Florida, the West Indies, New York, and England. Whatever their uncertain future, they are almost certain to fare better than the Loyalists who stay behind. October 1782. John Adams finally arrives in Paris, a commercial treaty with the Dutch in hand. The peace talks begin in earnest. Franklin has prepared the ground for the younger, more aggressive Adams and John Jay to take over the reins. With their wildly different personalities, these three make a brilliant, though less than harmonious, team. Adams mistrusts Franklin's reserve, which he interprets as devious. And Adams' intensity rubs everyone the wrong way. Jay insists that American independence be a non-negotiable precondition to any serious talks. I, mean, I think the United States were fortunate in having negotiators who had spent a fair amount of time in Europe, who were the intellectual peers of the men that they would be dealing with, and were unusually sly and wily people. Jay and Adams trust no one to look after United States interests including their French allies. Defying Congress's orders, they cut the French out of the process and deal only with the British. In the end, the three men work quite brilliantly together and pull off terms that are so extravagantly great for America that essentially the French will be reeling. How did these babes in the woods manage to pull this off? The French, to put it mildly, are outraged. Without them, the revolution would have surely failed. Yet these upstarts have dared to exclude them. We have essentially violated our contract with the French. And the French feel, understandably, cheated, traduced. Those treacherous Americans, we knew we couldn't trust them in the first place. It becomes Franklin's job to not only repair the insult, but to extract yet another loan from France's depleted treasury. 
he goes off to see the French foreign minister, the Count de Vergennes, and says to him two things. First of all, we're babes in the woods. We made a mistake. We didn't know how to do this properly, which of course was completely the opposite of the truth. Um, and secondly, the British really would like to divide us. They love the idea that they've divided us. Let's not give them that satisfaction. He does that masterfully, as only Franklin could have. He's extremely subtle. And Vergen is dumbstruck by the speech, but really can't do anything about it, and essentially jumps on board. On November 30th, the British sign a tentative agreement that for the first time acknowledges the former colonies as the United States of America. Almost all of its provisions prove favorable to the Americans. Britain will recognize the 13 free and sovereign states. The states get guaranteed fishing rights off of Newfoundland. The western boundary of the United States will be defined by the Mississippi River, with navigation and fishing rights shared by America and Britain, but not France or Spain. The provisional treaty is sent back to America for approval. Parliament hoped to make a generous peace that would create goodwill in the United States, and the United States emerged from the peace conference with far more than they could have had right to expect. But even among the winners of this generous peace, there are losers. Many Americans will soon find out they have been left out. As the war with Britain draws to a close, discontent within the new nation threatens its very survival. Winter, 1783. A year and a half after the climactic battle of Yorktown, General George Washington is still waiting for an end to the war. A provisional treaty has been signed. Hostilities have all but ceased, but an official peace is not yet declared. With too much time on their hands and nothing to do but drill, discontent festers. At the New Windsor, New York encampment, mutiny is once again in the air. The officers of the Continental Army were extremely frustrated. Peace negotiations were dragging on. Congress had promised them officers' pensions years ago. They had still not approved that. There was months of back pay they were owed that had not been collected. They were enraged. Though they're on the verge of going home, furious officers threaten not to disarm until Congress honors its financial obligations to its fighting men. It was not outside the realm of feasibility that the Army might have, in fact, marched on Philadelphia and tried to depose the government. March 15th, Newburgh, New York. Hundreds of officers assemble at a meeting hall near the camp. A coup against Congress is becoming a serious threat. They pile in and they jam the hall. It's an airing of grievances. I mean, it's pretty obvious that they're going to they're going to decide to march on Congress and force the end. And Washington has a dilemma. He's the commander of the army. He has to defend Congress against his own men. How can he do that? They're mad at him. He hasn't helped them in this. He said he would, and nothing has happened. He, he told them that things take time. The wheels of Congress move slowly. They didn't want to hear that. So they're angry at him. All of a sudden, as the meeting starts, the commander in chief arrives alone. He walks to the front of the hall, and he makes a speech. As I have never left your side one moment, as I have been the constant companion and witness of your distresses. It can scarcely be supposed at this late stage of war that I am indifferent to its interests. This dreadful alternative of either deserting our country in the extremest hour of her distress or turning our arms against it has something shocking to it that humanity revolts at the idea. My God. He says wonderful things, but the speech goes over like lead. Then he says he's going to read a letter from a member of Congress to add to what he has to say. He picks up the letter. He can't read the letter. He takes out his glasses, 
And he, and he tells the men that I've got to read this letter with my glasses because like you, in addition to growing gray, I have gone blind in the service to my country. And this ad lib line that he didn't intend to say hits these men like a punch to the stomach. And then all of a sudden, these tough, hard soldiers, they begin to weep uncontrollably. This admiration for the commander, he never took a vacation. He's been at the front lines being shot at like us. He's held us together for eight years. Everywhere we've been, he's been with us. There's this unbelievable connection between the officers and him. That was the end of the rebellion. There was no rebellion. I think that moment in 1783 is one of the great moments in American history and Washington at his finest. It was a moment of real danger. Americans had always suspected a standing army, suspected what it might do, suspected that it might actually take power. And this is the moment where it might actually have occurred. A month later, in April, Congress receives England's official declaration to end all hostilities. One after another, the European countries have recognized the United States of America as a sovereign nation. By June, most of the Continental Army disbands, and Washington awaits the peaceful evacuation of Britain's last stronghold, New York City. New York has become the last safe place for loyalists. As the British military prepares to leave, the city is overrun by thousands of black and white refugees who desperately need to get out. Some 100,000 blacks who had thrown in their lot with the British had been offered protection. Now the question is, will the British make good on their promise? Washington was demanding that the British restore slaves to their masters, and so there was a lot of concern. But by and large, the British didn't do that. By and large, the former slaves left America with the British. The fate of the slaves who escaped is mixed. We know that 3,000 went from New York up to Canada. Uh, a few hundred went to England. Lots of them were sent to the Bahamas and other places as slaves, and some were returned forcibly. By the fall, the Treaty of Paris is signed. In November, the last of the British soldiers leave New York. After seven long years, General George Washington, with what remains of his army, returns triumphant to New York City, the scene of his most humiliating defeat. One eyewitness observes. The troops that marched in were ill-clad and weather-beaten and made a forlorn appearance, but then they were our troops. And as I looked at them and thought upon all they had done for us, my heart and my eyes were full, and I admired and gloried in them the more. Americans can finally celebrate. After a war that's inflicted 25,000 military deaths, 1% of the US population, the people are ready to leave war behind and look to the future. Everyone realizes that something momentous has happened, but the joy will be short-lived. The war is at an end, but the American Revolution is far from over. We've only seen the first act. The political and social sorting out was far from over. The Revolution's second act will be every bit as perilous for the new nation as the first. The war's aftermath is about to bring the fragile alliance of states dangerously close to disintegration. The Continental Congress, December 23rd, 1783. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action. 
and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission and take my leave of all the employment of public life. George Washington. At this moment, if he wanted to, George Washington could rule the new United States. But he walks away. He submits $100,000 for expenses, asks no payment for his services, and he goes home to Mount Vernon. George Washington's decision startled everyone. What happens in revolutions is that the head of the, the revolutionary army that wins takes over. You become a king or a dictator for life, you take over. You don't leave and go home. He never really thought about it. It was time to go, and he went. The war is finally over. The British and their loyalists, both white and black, are gone. The American army has, for the most part, disbanded. But many in America will soon realize that the long-awaited peace is anything but. For American Indians, the revolution was a disaster. They were on the losing side, and when the British walked away from the Indian allies, the same American weapons, the same American officers, the same American enlisted men in many cases turned their guns west against the Native Americans. And a long war of national expansion into the west occurred. But it's not just the Indians who suffer. Go. The end of the war brings political and economic chaos. Fear and anger spread through all 13 states at every level. People are tired out. The economy was in shambles. There was no currency at the end of the war. It had lost all its value. There's serious economic problems. The new United States is really a very fragile country. A lot of their leaders are very worried exactly how they're going to keep this group of states together is always a question. The only thing binding the states into a union are the Articles of Confederation, a very weak compact that assigns joint policy-making power to the Continental Congress. The Congress cannot, however, regulate trade, levy taxes, or issue currency. The Articles were drafted at the same time as the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but it took five years for the fiercely independent states to agree to even this feeble central authority. The government under the Articles of Confederation failed badly. There was no central chief executive. Congress had no power to tax. There were rebellions against authority. The revolution that started over British taxes has ended up with new conflicts over state taxes. Returning veterans are losing their farms to bankers and tax collectors. This is not what they fought for, and many are ready to take action. Take the farmer in Massachusetts. At the end of the war, in a broken economy, he can't pay his taxes. And the legislature says we can't retire the revolutionary debt, which is huge, without imposing taxes. So we have a very difficult situation here. It leads to Shays' Rebellion in 1786. Daniel Shays is a fed up veteran and farmer from Western Massachusetts. In August 1786, he leads 4,000 men on an armed insurrection against county and state courts to halt farm foreclosures. The same men who fought in the Massachusetts line in the revolution are now fighting against their own government. They're closing courthouses. In September, Shays' rebels force closure of Massachusetts' highest court, the Supreme Court in Springfield. The Massachusetts governor sends 4,400 state militiamen to put down the rebellion. The soldiers easily rout Shays and his men with cannon fire and grape shot. Four of Shays' men die, 
But the rebellion has made its point. The states are in chaos, and they had better unite behind some kind of central government. Fast. As a whole, this unit doesn't work yet. And if it doesn't find a way to work, what's going to be the mechanism that's going to ensure that that independence is preserved and secured? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. In the coming months, provide for the, common defense. the quest for a more perfect union will begin. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. These are the grand words that will soon introduce a brand new constitution to the people of a floundering nation. But finding grand words will be the easy part. The hard part will be coming up with a compact to satisfy all the competing interests before the whole noble experiment falls apart. May 1787, Philadelphia. It's now or never for the anything but United States of America. If they don't come up with a constitution to establish a functioning central government, the new nation will most certainly implode. The states send 55 delegates to a constitutional convention to repair the woefully inadequate Articles of Confederation. There are all kinds of questions about what's going to be the direction for this new nation. And you can't have 13 different answers, you need to have one answer. These men are charged with nothing less than devising a whole new system of government. The one thing they can agree on is to keep the proceedings secret to ensure candor and allow a full range of argument. Among the group are both new and old faces, including the most revered man in America. Washington is the presiding chairman, the president of the Constitutional Convention. His presence is very important for the legitimacy of this new Constitution. The last thing George Washington wanted to do after eight grueling years of war was leave his beloved Mount Vernon home. At 55, he is tempted to rest on his laurels, but he is keenly aware that all his efforts could be undone if government doesn't change. I think Washington is nervous about what's going to happen to the country if they don't have a new form of government. He has a national vision of America. That's why he's important to be in that room. There are other visions in the room. Alexander Hamilton from New York is a brilliant 32-year-old war veteran and attorney. Benjamin Franklin, the great negotiator, now old, frail, but ever wise and reliable, joins the Pennsylvania delegation. Among the missing are two of the revolution's most forceful voices, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who are serving as foreign ministers in England and France. Adams and Jefferson just, I think, are frantic with the fact that a new government's being written about and they're not there. In their place, the man with the plan, the Virginia plan, is James Madison a 36-year-old career politician from Virginia. Madison knew this moment would come and has spent years formulating a new governing structure. His Virginia plan, with a foundation as old as the Greeks and as recent as the state's own constitutions, proposes three branches of government, an executive, a two-house legislature, and a judiciary, with each branch serving as a check on the power of the others. Throughout the hot summer of 1787, arguments rage about the balance of power between large states and small states, between South and North, between civilian and military authority. There's a real concern about democracy run amok. There's a real concern about monarchism returning. There's a concern about the states having too much power. There's a concern about this new national government having too much power. And so it's really a balancing act to make sure that there is a structure that does not let anyone monopolize power. A lot of folks in the country fear a new democratic federal government just as they fear the power of the crown. Another big issue, how are you going to represent people? 
You can have two houses, but do you count the small states the same as the big states or the big states overwhelm the small states? How are you going to get around that? The months wear on and tempers wear thin. Some delegates go home and some states threaten to bolt. I fear, worries Alexander Hamilton, that we shall let slip the golden opportunity of rescuing the American empire from disunion, anarchy, and misery. But under Washington's patient hand, the delegates stay the course, and the long days and nights of argument and compromise produce a workable draft. It is only four pages, made up of a preamble and seven articles that outline the structure of a new national government. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. You can have two senators from each state, and they'll be sort of where the brains are. And representatives in the House of Congress will be apportioned by population. And that's where the virtue will lie the sort of sense of what the people want. So if you have them both, you get the wisdom of the Senate and the virtue of the people. Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during a term of four years, and together with the Vice President... Washington exerts his greatest term. influence in fashioning the unprecedented role of an elected president. After years of wrangling with Continental Congress during the war, he knows better than anyone the need for a decisive executive. The president will execute the laws of Congress and as a civilian will act as the commander in chief of the National Army and Navy. Military tyranny, something they're determined to avoid. So the respect for civilian authority is something that plays a large role in the new constitution. These first two articles and the third establishing a Supreme Court form the heart of an unprecedented democracy. But the document also contains a blatant anomaly, slavery. Slavery was in clear counterpoint to the ideals of the revolution, but these guys believed very strongly, particularly in the plantation economies, that slavery was the basis of their livelihood. Many of them felt that slavery was wrong. Those who were dependent upon it could not figure out a way to escape it. With the South threatening to secede, the delegates agreed to continue the importation of slaves for another 20 years. Another clause prohibits any state from harboring or freeing escaped slaves from their masters. For the purpose of counting population, Slaves are defined as three-fifths of a person. Otherwise, they are property, not people. Even though slavery was such a hot topic of discussion at the convention, the word slave or slavery does not appear in that document at all. You will find slavery talked about, just not named. You know, they will use euphemisms like those not free, other persons, and so on. Slavery is so interwoven in, in the economy of the South that they just can't bring themselves to right this wrong. And they basically postponed the problem to be reckoned with on another day. That day became the Civil War. It was a pretty bad day. On September 17, 1787, 39 exhausted delegates signed the finished document. The Constitution they have fashioned to form a more perfect union is an imperfect compromise of visions, and few of the signers, if any, are truly satisfied. But with characteristic optimism, Benjamin Franklin sets aside his own reservations and fully endorses it. I think it will astonish our enemies who are waiting to hear that our states are on the point of separation. Thus, I consent to this constitution because I expect no better and because I am not sure that it is not the best. Two days later, the proposed United States Constitution goes into print. Born in secrecy, it takes the public by complete surprise. 
Few expected such a sweeping new form of government, but the people will study it and argue it, and soon they too will have their say. For all the talk about popular sovereignty that had gone on during the war, and that's what we were fighting for, what we come to in the end is a small group of people at the top determining what they think the fate of the nation should be, and then having to sell it as if a product to the rest. It will take nearly a year for the required two-thirds of the states to ratify this Constitution. On June 21st, 1788, it becomes the law of the land. Washington returns once again to Mount Vernon after the signing of the Constitution, hoping to live out his days there. But he knows, like virtually every other American, that when it comes time to elect the first president of the United States, it is he who will be called. He is the only person that could be the president. Nobody else could hold the United States together. Everybody trusted and admired him. Only he could do this. He feels that history is drawing him to this. That it's a destiny of some kind. In a time like no other, when history has made men and men have made history, no one more than George Washington has guided the destiny of America. Twice he has taken the stage, and twice he has left it. Now, for the third time, his people and the lure of posterity call him to take the helm of this new nation and lead it into its unprecedented and uncertain future as the United States of America. Mount Vernon, Virginia, April 16, 1789. George Washington, gentleman farmer and former commander of America's revolutionary forces, is packing to leave his beloved home once again. For eight years, Washington led the American army through a grueling war and no one believed he could win against the most powerful empire in the world, Great Britain. His army lost more battles than it won. But by sheer will and perseverance, they marched their way to ultimate victory. Now, at 57, nothing would make George Washington happier than to live out his days in the serenity of Mount Vernon. Washington has very much subordinated himself to the needs of the nation. He has made untold sacrifices. He really does intend to retire quietly to civilian life. But Washington's long revolutionary road has not yet reached an end. For the former commander-in-chief of the army has again been summoned into service by Congress and the country. He is off on a trip to New York City to be sworn in as the first president of the United States of a new America. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to the place of his execution. So unwilling am I, in the evening of a life nearly consumed in public cares, to quit a peaceful abode for an ocean of difficulties. George Washington. Everybody tells George Washington it isn't that they think he should be the president. He must be the president. His eight-day ride will take him across many of the former colonies of America, through the bloody battlefields where thousands lost their lives under his command. Lives given in the name of liberty. 
It is a journey that will have the future president not only looking ahead, but looking back as well at what made George Washington the greatest American general. The year is 1775, 14 years earlier. The place, Continental Congress. George Washington is about to take center stage. 10 years of riots and rebellion have set the 13 American colonies ablaze. The Stamp Act riots. The Boston Massacre. The Boston Tea Party. These have brought the British Army to American soil. Lexington, Concord, and the Battle of Bunker Hill have pitted citizen soldiers against the most powerful empire in the world. Now the colonists need an army and someone to lead it. June 15, 1775. John Adams, Massachusetts delegate and well-known revolutionary thinker, lays out a proposal. The creation of a professional army. And Adams calls for the immediate appointment of a commander to head up this new force. The choice is unanimous. A gentleman planter from Virginia, a hero in the French and Indian War of the 1750s, and the only delegate to show up every day in his military uniform, 43-year-old George Washington. Well, he's a very impressive guy. I mean, he wears his military uniform with great dignity, and of course, he shows up making the point. I have military experience. I am a person who you can count on as your military commander. He has the image to do it. He's got the experience. He's from Virginia. They make him the commander in chief and he, he modestly says, I'm, I'm really not equal to the task and I'll just do my best. Later, there will be times when Congress will wonder if his best is good enough. But there were few men in 1775 with the experience and most importantly, the character to take on the job of commander in chief. July, 1775. Two weeks after his appointment, Washington arrives in Cambridge, Massachusetts to take charge of his soldiers and is stunned by the condition of his so-called army. These men are ragged, disheveled, getting drunk on duty, no knowledge of how to handle a musket efficiently. There was no discipline. There was certainly no hygiene, um, very little structure. It was a mess. These are Washington's revolutionaries. These are the soldiers given him to defend against the British Army. He has precious little time to turn this woefully undisciplined, underprepared, undersupplied army into a force that can stand up against the strongest empire in the world. Today, the summer of 1775, now 14 years ago, is a distant memory. It was hardly the way Washington had expected to lead an upstart group of rebels to glory against a mighty superpower. But Washington was never the kind of leader who would let any challenge stand in his way. He was very aware, I think, that he had a role to play in history and wanted to create a legacy that he could be proud of and America could be proud of. Making the country proud began with a winter assault and, more importantly, the advice of others. Winter, 1776. It has been six months since Washington has taken charge of the Continental forces. His army is a ragtag lot of citizen insurgents. But ever since the Battle of Concord, the untrained force has managed to hem the British into the city of Boston. Now, the question is, how to get them out? Washington is eager to bring the fight to the British, to launch his first offensive of the war. His plan? To send waves of foot soldiers into a full frontal attack on the city of Boston. 
Yet his young officers like Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox stand in staunch opposition. George Washington always had the ability to listen to many people. He thinks everybody's view is important. And if he can listen to enough opinions, he'll know as much as they do. A hallmark of good leadership. Instead, Washington's officers suggest using an untapped resource. 120,000 pounds of artillery captured by the Americans from a remote New York outpost, Fort Ticonderoga. They propose hauling the cannon under the cover of night to Dorchester Heights and training this newly acquired firepower on the enemy below. Washington considers the idea and knows it is the right choice. He orders the plan into action. On the morning of March 5, 1776, British General Howe awakes to the sight of 20 cannon pointing down on his ships in the harbor. With one stroke, the Americans checkmate the British. It's not until after they see Ticonderoga's guns on Dorchester Heights that they realize they got to get the heck out of there. And so they do. 8,900 British soldiers and 1,100 loyalists, the Americans siding with the British, take just two weeks to board their ships and leave the colonies. For now. Washington savors the first victory of his command. Boston, the beloved birthplace of the revolution, is back in patriot hands, thanks in no small part to the good sense and creativity of his young officers. But peering over his shoulder, just waiting for him to stumble, are a number of his more senior officers. Over time, Generals Charles Lee, Horatio Gates, and Benedict Arnold will each connive to undermine Washington's command. The winter of 1776 was just the beginning, and that easy victory at Boston was but a fleeting illusion. For seven more years of war still lay ahead war that taxed every fiber of his character to survive, let alone to become president. April 17, 1789, a world-weary but resolute George Washington enters the second day of his journey to New York City, where he will soon be sworn in as the first president of the United States of America. Washington now heads to Baltimore, Maryland, where the great hero of the revolution is greeted by 10,000 citizens at the cannon salutes of the new nation he is destined to lead. There are a few people who are legends in their own time, and Washington was deservedly one of them. I am so much affected by this fresh proof of my country's esteem and confidence that silence can best explain my gratitude, George Washington. The road before him is daunting. It will wind through political territory never before explored by any man in history. But Washington and America have grown accustomed to blazing new trails, a course that was set some 13 years earlier. New Year's Day, 1776, the first day of a momentous year for a nation in the throes of birth. This is the day Washington receives news. Britain's King George III has issued a proclamation, crush the rebellion by any means necessary. They are words that only serve to steal the resolve of the general and his men and are the first in a year marked by words. For now, a voice rises in the colonies that galvanizes the cause, words from another Englishman, words that will help lead the colonies out of rebellion and into revolution. We have it within our power to begin the world over again. It is not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Now is the seed time of continental union. 
The writer, Thomas Paine. The words, what Americans long to hear. It is a 46-page pamphlet titled simply, Common Sense, and it spreads like wildfire throughout the colonies. Some say 100,000 copies of this were published. Translate that into population rates today, that would be like selling 20 million books at, through Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Payne's common sense releases the genie from the bottle. Words mixed with an idea to break totally with the king, to be independent. Suddenly in every tavern, in every meeting house, everywhere people congregate, they're talking seriously about this idea. Should we go for independence or not? It is a potent tonic for a people in revolt. In the ranks of Washington's army, the transforming effect of the words is immediate. It touched everyone of that era. Everyone knew they had a stake in it. And it was perhaps the most glorious moment in the history of this country where people really did believe the birthday of a new world is at hand. It has been years since Washington has seen Thomas Paine. The author of Common Sense has left America behind, off to sow the seeds of a new revolution in another country, where the word liberty is on everyone's tongue. France, the monarchy that backed the Americans in the War of Independence, is trembling from the same democratic forces she helped unleash in America. Peasants and common people are shaking the foundations of centuries of feudal rule. Payne may have departed this new nation, but it was his words that helped lay the groundwork for the world's seminal revolutionary document, America's Declaration of Independence. Spring 1776. George Washington is moving his men south from Boston toward the next big military battle. The British are coming back. Their target, New York City. 100 miles to the south, the Continental Congress has reconvened in Philadelphia for a fight of their own, the political battle for independence. Here, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, John Hancock, and luminaries from all 13 colonies prepare to declare in writing their intention to break from Britain. They turn to a young Virginia lawyer, a rising star in American politics, 33-year-old Thomas Jefferson, to craft the words that will spell treason against the king. It is a heady and vexing task to articulate the cause for which people are willing to die the cause of liberty. But defining liberty, that is the rub. Who's in and who's out? Who's included? Does this mean everybody? Does this mean only the rich? Does this mean property holders? How far do we go? Who's included in this new nation? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But does that really mean all men? There is the matter of slavery. Jefferson owned slaves. Washington owned slaves. And these are the men leading the fight for human liberty. Slavery was in clear counterpoint to the ideals of the revolution. These guys weren't idiots. They understood the notion of paradox. But they also believed very strongly particularly in the plantation economies, that slavery was the basis of their livelihood. July 1st, 1776. Jefferson delivers his final draft of the Declaration to Congress and watches in horror as the delegates tear it apart. And that was three days of debate in Congress in which Congress took out 89 different things, including any language criticizing the practice of slavery. And Jefferson just sat there writhing through the whole thing. With the issue of slavery now tabled for another day, the 
final draft is approved. America has a birthday, July 4th. Copies are taken by horseback everywhere throughout the colonies. In the town squares all over the country, church bells were ringing, and the people were huzzahing, the crowd was applauding. People really did believe the birthday of a new world is at hand. It's happened so many other times since the American Revolution that it's easy to overlook its novelty. A nation declaring itself independent, really without precedent. It is a decisive moment for every American, and an especially grave one for the commander of the Continental Army. There is no turning back, and now the British, with the largest force ever sent across the ocean, are descending upon New York City. For Washington, that memorable year, 1776, is one he would rather forget. Because of the Declaration of Independence, history has recorded it as epic and glorious. But for Washington, it stands out as perhaps the most grueling and humiliating of his life. April 18, 1789, 5 a.m. Few men in America have slept in as many different places as George Washington. This morning, he makes final preparations to leave Baltimore, beginning the third day of his northward trip to New York City. There, in just a matter of days, he will be inaugurated as the first president of the United States. It will be a triumphant moment for a man whose confidence and reputation once lay in tatters, just weeks after the exuberance that followed the Declaration of Independence. We tend to look back from today and see Washington always having been that legend. But in fact, if you stopped the clock in 1776, you would have suspected that this guy would be out of a job pretty soon. Summer, 1776. The nation has been set afire with the idea of liberty. But at his headquarters in New York City, General George Washington is faced with the reality of what stands between the colonies and their independence. The British have returned, spectacularly. 130 warships and nearly 25,000 men sail into New York Harbor. When the British come in the summer of 1776, it's like Star Wars. It's the Empire Strikes Back. This is the most powerful military nation on Earth that is bringing that power to bear on you. It is a sight to unnerve even the most battle-hardened soldier. The British sailed past Manhattan and set up camp on Staten Island. Washington was faced with a tremendous task. Uh, he had no navy to speak of, and he was trying to protect a group of islands with hundreds of miles of shoreline against the world's most powerful naval force. Washington's men spend the summer digging in on Long Island's Brooklyn Heights, where they expect the British to launch their attack. Liberty must equal war. Late August, 1776. In the early morning, the British commander, General William Howe, makes his move. More than 20,000 British soldiers march toward the American positions. It is their first head-on attack against Washington's army. is a bloodbath. The Continental Army is totally overwhelmed. On this day, 300 Americans die, and another 1,000 are captured before beating a swift and chaotic retreat. 
Washington watches in shock as the best trained army in the world easily outmaneuvers his. In one stroke, the British have nearly destroyed the American army and put a quick end to the so-called War of Independence. Washington is forced to make a desperate move before all is lost. Under cover of night, he orders an all-out retreat back to Manhattan. Washington may not have a navy, but he has resourceful, courageous fishermen from Massachusetts. All through the night, they use any boat they can get their hands on to ferry 9,000 men to the safety of Manhattan. At dawn, the Americans receive one providential break. A strange and eerie fog sets in over New York Harbor. The British see and hear nothing as the last of the soldiers escape. When the fog lifts, the British find only a deserted enemy camp. The Continental Army has vanished. The failure to capture them and to put a stop to the war by rounding up the rebel forces really was one of the greatest blunders of the war. The British lost their best opportunity to win the war at a stroke. Washington's army is now an army on the run, and the British waste no time in launching a new offensive. In battle after battle, the Continental Army is overwhelmed by the superior power and sheer number of British forces. They are driven off the Isle of Manhattan. This really negatively affects the morale of his force, and perhaps more importantly, affects the morale of some of his subordinate commanders, who really now question whether or not Washington is the right man for this job. Washington leads the remains of his defeated army on a retreat, south into New Jersey. A little more than a year into his command, the general is now pursued by the British and under siege from his own officers. One of them, Charles Lee, Washington's most experienced general, sees a perfect opportunity to supplant his commander-in-chief, and he isn't shy about saying so to anyone who might help him get ahead. A certain great man is most damnably deficient. I foresaw all that has happened. Had I the powers, I could do much good. General Charles Lee. One of Lee's confidants, an increasingly disillusioned officer named Joseph Reed, encourages Lee to make a move against the commander-in-chief. Washington is totally unaware of the designs of Lee and Reed. That is, until a courier delivers him the wrong letter. My dear Reed, I lament with you that fatal indecision of mind which in war is a much greater disqualification than stupidity or even want of personal courage. Eternal defeat must attend the men of the best parts if cursed with indecision. General Charles Lee. Washington's response was to write to Reed and say, I opened this by accident, I thought it was official business, and to just try to smooth it over. I think all of these moments really just highlight the extraordinary equilibrium that he maintained. Washington lets it pass but he now knows that his power is weakening and that both British and American wolves are at his heels. As Washington flees across New Jersey, he fully realizes that this revolution might be over. He's a commander in chief of an army that has shrunk drastically. Congressmen write their wives and their friends letters saying that the game is just about up. They're fearful that this war is shortly going to be over. Washington had never been lower than those dark days of 1776. Others thought him destined for oblivion rather than legend. But legends are made from character and vision. 
Just when all seemed lost, he summoned both with one bold stroke. April 19, 1789. Day four of George Washington's journey to New York City to become the first president of the United States. Leaving Maryland behind, he is heading toward Wilmington, Delaware. Washington crosses the fields and dells of America and passes the tributaries that lead to a river of great personal importance, the vital Delaware River, scene of one of Washington's greatest reversals of fortune. 13 years before. December 1776. In its Pennsylvania camp, the Continental Army finds itself back on its heels. Washington's poor judgment has cost the Americans New York City and depleted his fighting force. The British now occupy New Jersey and place Hessian forces at key junctions along the Delaware places like Trenton. There, the King's men will catch their breath before the next season of fighting. In the American camp, faith in the revolution is falling as fast as the temperature, and many of his soldiers are ready to quit when their enlistments expire at year's end. Recently embedded with Washington's flagging army was the author of Common Sense, Thomas Paine, who bore witness to their travail. Again, he wields his pen to inspire a people with words, capturing the moment and the mood in a pamphlet. American Crisis. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and to repulse it. Time hath found us. Thomas Paine. Washington takes these words to heart. It is time to act, to rescue the cause. With the end of the year fast approaching, Washington makes a bold decision to take his army across the Delaware River in a surprise attack at Trenton. Washington chooses Christmas Day to reveal his plan to his troops and readies them to reverse the course and take the fight to the British. The crossing is a monumental task. The same Massachusetts fishermen who had helped the army retreat from Brooklyn Heights in August must now put the army on the offensive. Ferrying 2,400 soldiers, horses, and artillery across the near frozen river in blizzard conditions, and do it before dawn. Washington himself will lead his soldiers into battle. Every school child in America is familiar with the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, when he's boldly in the front of the boat, standing up, looking heroically towards the eastern shore of the river. It would have been nice, but it didn't happen like that. Nobody stood up that night Wisely so. In worsening weather, the crossing takes forever. Yet the plan remains, get to Trenton by dawn. But there is still a nine mile march ahead of the Continentals. Light or no light, Washington has everything riding on this. The soldiers, some with only rags on their feet, must push on. When they arrive, the Hessians are caught off guard. The surprise attack is glorious. The Battle of Trenton is a brutal encounter. The Americans surprise the Hessians who tumble out of their barracks, grab their muskets, and attempt to defend themselves. The battle lasts less than an hour. The Hessians don't have a chance because they're surprised. This is Washington's day. He sends a resounding message to the British and Americans alike.
Continental Army is back, and I am its undisputed leader. Through most of the fall, there have been a number of officers who thought they could do his job better than he could, and a number of members of Congress who thought the same. That changes after Trenton. Washington's triumph at Trenton was unmercifully short-lived. Back then, in 1777, he was still desperate for supplies and men to keep the war effort going. And most of all, Washington needed a navy against the British, who had total control of the port of New York City. Critical help would come from an old war horse who never fired a shot or put on a uniform. To the rescue, came the incomparable Benjamin Franklin. April 20th, 1789. The fifth day of George Washington's trip to New York City. His inauguration as the first president of the United States is just days away. And Washington expresses the optimism of a new nation to an old friend from France. I really entertain greater hopes than I have at almost any former period that America will not finally disappoint the expectations of her friends, George Washington. Washington and the United States owe a great debt to France and to the man who brought the European superpower to America's side 12 years earlier, Benjamin Franklin. It is winter, 1777. Benjamin Franklin has just arrived in France on a secret mission. Franklin's writings and scientific discoveries have made him the most famous American in the world. Now his assignment is to use all his diplomatic skills to bring France's navy and treasury to America's side. It seems like a fool's errand when you think about it. Franklin is sent to an absolute monarchy to ask them to fund a revolution against a king. If anyone can bring the French on board, it is the wise and canny Franklin. But he needs Washington to appear as if he can win this war. Yet across the ocean in America, nothing could be farther from the truth. August 22, 1777, Hartsville, Pennsylvania. American scouts bring alarming news to Washington. The British fleet have entered the Chesapeake Bay and plan to launch an attack on Philadelphia, the capital of the newly confederated United States. Washington quickly moves his army south through Philadelphia to meet the British head on. Three weeks later, Washington positions his forces along the banks of a tributary to the Delaware River called Brandywine Creek. It is here that he will make his stand against the advancing British. September 11th, 1777, the Battle of Brandywine. Musket and artillery fire erupt between the two armies. 25,000 soldiers clash on the field. It is an intense and bloody battle. The Continental Army successfully holds off the British into the afternoon. What Washington doesn't know is that his main force has only been engaging half of British General Howe's army. The other half has been sent on a day-long march to the west, around the American defenses, and is now headed for a surprise attack from behind. The battle becomes a rout. Washington is forced to retreat, giving up the fight and giving up Philadelphia. An ocean away in Paris, the loss of Philadelphia is hardly the news Benjamin Franklin needs to bring the French into the war. His old hometown, 
the new capital is now in British hands, and the Continental Congress has fled to York, Pennsylvania. But Franklin betrays little concern. He even manages to spin the loss as good news for the Americans, remarking, instead of Howe taking Philadelphia, Philadelphia has taken Howe. Franklin predicts to the dubious French that to hold Philadelphia, Howe will be hard pressed to commit his troops elsewhere. While back in America, George Washington can hardly afford to be so cool. His humiliation emboldens the rivals in his ranks, most notably the head of the northern wing of the Continental Army, General Horatio Gates. Gates is a proud, though somewhat disheveled man. British-born, he left England's rigid military class structure five years earlier for a chance to gain glory in America. Gates sees his opportunity. He will make a stand against the British force that is cutting a swath through Upper New York in their bid to gain control of the Hudson River, right into the fields of Saratoga. Gates is not the only American officer looking for glory. He has his own rival at Saratoga, in the person of an arrogant and determined general, Benedict Arnold. Over a meal of ox heart, Arnold and Gates talk strategy, and the two couldn't be more different in temperament. Arnold, aggressive and anxious for battlefield glory, wants to attack the British. The more passive and gun-shy Gates wants to wait for the British to come to them. Horatio Gates couldn't stand Benedict Arnold, considered him an upstart, an arrogant upstart. And Benedict Arnold, like many of the revolutionary soldiers, called Gates Granny Gates, a fussy old woman. Tempers flare. The conversation turns heated. And Gates banished his best general from the dinner table, insulted him, wouldn't let him come to meetings. And Benedict Arnold fumed as a result of that dinner and decided that he would have to defy the orders of his commanding officer because he believed the Americans were going to be beaten if it were up to Granny Gates. October 7th, 1777. Just south of Saratoga, on a rise of land called Bemis Heights, Gates sets 2,400 men out to meet 1,500 British soldiers. A heated battle erupts. On the field, Benedict Arnold, in defiance of Gates' orders, leads an aggressive charge against the Royals. Arnold employed snipers. He got riflemen, highly accurate, put them up in trees. It was a new kind of warfare, and the British didn't adapt to it. It is a strategy that gives the Americans the upper hand, but at a high price. Arnold takes a musket ball to his leg and is nearly crushed by his horse. When the battle was over, his second in command said, Sir, where are you hit? And Arnold said, it's my leg. I wish it had been my heart. And I do too, I wish it had been in his heart because if he had died at that moment, he would have been the great hero of the revolution. Arnold's battlefield daring has effectively destroyed Britain's northern force while Gates had directed the battle from the safety of his desk. Yet it is Horatio Gates who takes the credit for the victory. It is not the last slight that Benedict Arnold will have to endure. The British bid for supremacy of the Hudson River ends in surrender. Had General Howe sent reinforcements, the British might have won. But just as Benjamin Franklin predicted, Howe's army was stuck holding Philadelphia. Across the ocean in France, Franklin now has what he needs to bring the French on board. The news of victory at Saratoga is exactly what France's King Louis XVI has needed to hear. 
He pledges part of his army, and more importantly, his navy, to the American cause in what amounts to a declaration of war between France and England. The American Revolution, which started as a far-off colonial uprising, is now a world war. For Washington, the victory at Saratoga is both good news and bad. He welcomes France's entry into the war, but the anointment of Horatio Gates as the hero of Saratoga again raises questions over who should be in charge of this army. A future as a national hero couldn't have been further from Washington's mind back in 1777. <coughs> And he had another long winter to face at the much storied Valley Forge. This was the moment when Washington had to turn around his army and his leadership, or there would never be a United States of America, let alone a President Washington. April 20th, 1789. George Washington, the former Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, has been called back into service by his new nation, the United States of America. For eight years, Washington led the Continental Army through a war against the most powerful empire in the world, a war few believed he could win. Now he is on the fifth day of a journey to the city of New York, where he will be sworn in as America's first president. At each town along the way, banquets and parties are thrown as the new nation celebrates the great American hero of the revolution. Next stop, City Tavern, the city, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, the former rebel capital, is a fitting halfway stop on Washington's journey. Eleven years earlier, he faced one of his greatest challenges at a place just outside the city, a place that even now, in 1789, has become an American legend, a place called Valley Forge. January 1778. Washington is making winter camp at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. It has been another long year of fighting, and his men are in desperate need of rest, of resupplying, of retraining. But building and running a camp a third the size of Philadelphia is a mammoth undertaking. Washington relishes the task, overseeing to the last detail the layout of the barracks, the placement of roads, the location of defenses. His hands-on approach wins the admiration of his soldiers. He assures his men that he will share in every hardship and partake in every inconvenience. And for the first month, he lives in a tent at the edge of camp alongside his soldiers. Yet for all his efforts, supply shortages become a problem. Washington pleads with Congress for more aid, but to little avail. By February, 2,500 soldiers are dead from disease. More than have been killed in battle since the war began. Thousands of others are stricken with sickness and hunger. Washington will need help to turn this looming disaster around. In mid-February, a new recruit arrives in camp. A foreign officer sent by the Continental Congress to lend badly needed experience to the cause. 
He calls himself Frederick William Augustus Heinrich Ferdinand, Baron von Steuben, and wears a bejeweled cross representing an honorary knighthood from Prussia. Curiously, von Steuben carries no papers confirming his supposed achievements. But Washington is desperate for leadership, for officers with European training. And he puts von Steuben to work. Baron von Steuben is a remarkable figure. Von Steuben's genius was the ability to distill the complexity of state-of-the-art European drill tactics into a digestible form to this raw material that was the American soldier. Under von Steuben's tutelage, Washington's ragtag army learns how to form solid, orderly columns, how to properly load and fire a weapon in formation, and the proper use of a bayonet. Von Steuben brings a new level of professionalism to the army, and that by itself creates its own sense of belonging. They're belonging to something larger than themselves. Every soldier is taught von Steuben's techniques, which become the basis of the Army's first training manual. Von Steuben's work gives Washington confidence. His army is now ready to meet the British head on. With the spring thaw comes news that the British are pulling out of Philadelphia and marching overland back to New York City. Britain's arch enemy, France, has recently entered the war. And from his headquarters in Philadelphia, General Henry Clinton, Britain's new commanding officer, fears that an approaching French fleet will blockade New York City. He is determined to protect the city at all costs. Washington, eager to avenge his loss of Philadelphia the year before, decides to go on the offensive against the British as they cross New Jersey. His army has been trained and turned into a new and hard-fighting army. And that army and its commander are now convinced that they can beat any army on the face of the earth, and they are eager for the fight. And that fight comes on one of the hottest days of the war. June 28, 1778. In a searing heat, the Continental Army catches up with the British at a New Jersey crossroads called Monmouth Courthouse. Washington's second in command on this day is another of his old nemeses, General Charles Lee. Lee is charged with leading the advance force, while Washington forms a second wave of 7,000 soldiers seven miles behind. Three hours into the fight, Washington waits near the front line of battle where he encounters Lee's soldiers, who appear to be in retreat. Lee was not attacking. What was going on here? In fact, Lee had no battle plan, nothing. He was hopeful of victory somehow. It's obvious to all the men at Monmouth that there is no plan. The men retreat. In a fury, Washington rides ahead and intercepts General Lee himself. Nobody accurately knows what Washington said because it was almost sacrilegious to write down when George Washington swore. And whatever he called Lee, um, it was enough for Lee to get the idea and, and to get out of there. It is not the first time Lee has ignored Washington's orders but it will certainly be the last. Lee retires to the rear in shame. Washington now takes charge, ordering his retreating soldiers to form ranks to create a new front line against the fast approaching Redcoats. By the time the British arrive, exhausted from their march in woolen uniforms in the 100 degree heat, they find the Continental Army in a strong defensive position. The winter's training at Valley Forge has paid off, and Washington knows it. He then does something astounding. He rides back and forth in front of his lines to rally the troops, putting himself in the line of fire, risking his life as he asked his own men to risk their lives. 
the British open up on him and miraculously miss him. The Battle of Monmouth erupts. More than 20,000 soldiers clash continuously for five hours in the brutal heat, longer than any other battle of the war. In some of the most intense fighting these men have ever seen, Sunstroke kills as many as musket balls. When the smoke had cleared at Monmouth, it was a draw. Washington knew and the country knew that this new army that had come out of Valley Forge was a good one. They had held their own against the British. This renews the public's spirit for the war and forever solidifies Washington's position as the unquestioned commander-in-chief. Eleven years after the Battle of Monmouth, as his friends in Philadelphia toast his send-off to the presidency, that scorching June day stands as the moment Washington silenced Charles Lee and all his other critics, the day he climbed back on the road to immortality. April 21st, 1789. Day six of George Washington's journey to New York City gets underway. As he leaves Philadelphia, Washington is reminded of the man he personally appointed to run the city. A bold and brave American general he once admired and respected, and now despises more than any other man. Benedict Arnold, one of the most troubled and treacherous characters of the revolution. July 1778, City Tavern. Benedict Arnold has recently arrived in Philadelphia to assume his new post as military governor. He will attempt to restore order to the city after nine months of British occupation. Quite well healed now, Arnold seems to have forgotten his own troubled background. Though born into a prominent Connecticut family, Arnold's alcoholic father squandered their fortune, forcing his son to take a lowly apprenticeship as an apothecary. The determined young boy grew to become a successful yet angry man with ambitions of becoming a gentleman, and once war broke out, a hero. In 1775, it was Arnold who helped lead a daring raid on a remote British outpost, Fort Ticonderoga. But Arnold's co-commander on that mission, the wily frontiersman Ethan Allen, took complete credit for the capture of the fort. Two years later at Saratoga, Arnold's battlefield heroics were again usurped by a fellow officer, Horatio Gates. Though it was Arnold who led the fight and suffered a near-fatal wound, he received no credit for the victory. The people and the press hailed Gates as the new American hero. In fact, the hero of the battle was Benedict Arnold. Crippled by the injury from Saratoga, Arnold has relinquished a battlefield command for this new post in Philadelphia. Determined to make the best of it, he now throws himself into the job, but his actions begin to raise questions. Arnold's first act was to close all the stores. He said to take an inventory of what there was available, but immediately the accusations began to fly that he was cornering the market on goods that he was going to sell himself. I don't think Benedict Arnold was doing anything that many of the other generals on both sides did as a matter of custom. Well, he was just doing what was common practice at the time, but he got nailed for it. Arnold's questionable business dealings come under fire in the press with charges of corruption and abuse of power. Charges compounded by his choice in women. Arnold courts and marries 18-year-old Peggy Shippen, a beautiful young lady from a wealthy family and a suspected loyalist. 
she was a gorgeous young woman. She was extremely well-educated by her father, could run a business which appealed to a Yankee merchant like Arnold. Today, they would be considered a dynamite couple. But they are a couple under intense scrutiny. In an overheated political climate, the cries against Arnold's actions escalate for nearly a year. They are charges that will have to be answered. March 5, 1779, Benedict Arnold stands in the Continental Congress, called by a special investigative committee to answer the accusations levied against him. In his mind, he is yet again underappreciated, his honor unfairly tarnished. His statement is really a recitation of all that he did and all that he had lost. He'd been crippled for life. He'd been passed over for promotion several times. And he thought he had lost his honor with its lingering cloud over him. Arnold's impassioned defense vindicates him in front of Congress. But the charges just won't go away. Leading the attack against Arnold is Joseph Reed, formerly one of Washington's trusted officers, now the acting governor for the state of Pennsylvania. Reed threatens to withdraw Pennsylvania's support for the war if Washington refuses to take action against Arnold. And George Washington is forced to weigh in. The commander in chief wants to give the talented Arnold a well-deserved field command, but he needs Pennsylvania's support and agrees to issue a written rebuke to Arnold. Once the affair blows over, he can give Arnold the intended promotion. When Arnold receives the ruling from his commander-in-chief, the words are stinging. Reprehensible, imprudent, improper, for Arnold, it is the final slight. Now, in his mind, betrayed, he devises a betrayal of his own. He taps an old friend of Peggy's from the occupation of Philadelphia, British Major John Andre, and offers to surrender a mighty fort to the British in exchange for 20,000 British pounds and a general's rank in their army. It is a fort that even bears the general's name, Fort Arnold, also known as West Point. West Point is a prize the British have coveted since the beginning of the war, but have never been able to take with a military offensive. Control West Point, and you control the vital Hudson River, severing communication between New England and the rest of the colonies. At West Point, the river remains tidal which is to say at some times of the day it flows south and at other times of the day it flows north. This made West Point an ideal place to mount cannons on both sides of the river as ships had to navigate this very tricky curve. The British readily agree to Benedict Arnold's terms. And Arnold sets his plot in motion. Arnold takes a meeting with his commander in chief and uses Washington's desire to give him a field command to his advantage, persuading Washington to instead give him control of West Point. George Washington was puzzled that Benedict Arnold would want the command of West Point. Washington wanted to put him back into the line of battle, but Arnold insisted on West Point because that was the deal with the British. Now in charge of West Point, Arnold prepares detailed information on the fort and sets a meeting with the enemy. September 21st, Benedict Arnold and his British contact, Major John Andre, come face to face along the banks of the Hudson River. They go over the plans of the fort and troop movements. Arnold's treason is now complete. I think the biggest misconception about Arnold's treason is he did it for the money. I don't think he did. I don't think it was as simple as that. He did it for his pride. The money was secondary. 
Arnold will now wait for the moment when he and Peggy can slip quietly behind the British lines. But news is about to arrive that will change everything. Andre has been captured, and on him are discovered the plans to West Point. Arnold knows it is only a matter of moments before the plot is uncovered, so he flees. Just a few miles away, a familiar figure is making his way towards a breakfast meeting with a trusted general. When Washington arrives, it is clear something is amiss. Arnold is nowhere to be found. And Washington gets the news. John Andre has been captured with the plans to West Point. It all adds up to one undeniable conclusion. One of the great heroes of the revolution has sold out to the British. In British-held New York City, there is a new officer in their ranks, Brigadier General Benedict Arnold. His loving wife, Peggy, forced in shame from Philadelphia, now by his side. Arnold's treason was the highest in the young history of America was an act that shook George Washington to the core. That one of his highest ranking generals could betray the cause forever raised the question, who else might be considering the same? April 22nd, 1789. The last two days of George Washington's journey to the American presidency takes him through the countryside of New Jersey, a place of both grave humiliation and great success. It was here that his army retreated from the British in 1776. Here where he made his greatest reversal of fortune with a surprise attack at Trenton. But it was the winters at Morristown that proved to be his greatest challenge. Morristown, 1780. Washington has just received a dispatch from his southern army. They have been forced to surrender. Nearly 5,000 soldiers have fallen to the British at Charleston, South Carolina. His southern army is now lost, the South's major port in British hands. Outside of Washington's headquarters, the brutal winter of 1780 is taking a mighty toll on his army. The winter encampment in Morristown was a lot harder than the encampment in Valley Forge. Valley Forge seems to get all the press, but Morristown was really dire straits. It was a long winter. It's, it snowed in May. Soldiers are starving. Dissension and insubordination grow in the ranks. Some soldiers even threaten mutiny. Washington must step forward and rescue his command from the threat of chaos. Eight nooses, prepared for eight men charged with various offenses. Insubordination, forging documents, theft. All are sentenced to death. Washington orders the execution held before the entire camp for all his men to see. It is a carefully choreographed event. Washington wanted to use capital punishment particularly sparingly, but he also knew it was great theater. All eight were put on top of the gallows. Their graves had been dug in front of the gallows, and their coffins, which he ordered manufactured, placed next to the graves.
As they were about to be hung, a soldier stepped forward from the crowd. Reprieve. Reprieve from the commander in chief. Seven of the eight were freed. This time, just one man will hang for his crimes. But it would not be the end of the problems in Washington's ranks. One year later, it happens again. Mutiny erupts. Now it appears as if the Continental Army is unraveling. And without the army, there is no revolution. Washington takes swift and decisive action. Leaders of 200 mutineers are condemned to death. And to carry out the task of execution, Washington orders a group of the other mutineers to form the firing squad to pull the trigger on their own comrades in arms. It is a psychologically devastating punishment. The Morristown winters of 1780 and 1781 were some of Washington's darkest days. His army and the cause seemed to be coming apart. The war had to come to an end soon, but the question was how? The answer would come from the southern colonies, where one of Washington's favorite generals was leading a swift, moving fight. February 1781, North Carolina. Major General Nathaniel Greene is in the thick of a campaign against British General Charles Cornwallis. Rhode Island's native son and his force of 1,000 are traveling light, using guerrilla tactics against the heavily laden British Southern Army. A backwoods game of cat and mouse that wears the Redcoats down. Fights are few, but take a heavy toll. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina costs the British a quarter of their troops. By the summer, Cornwallis is spent. His weakened army limps into a small Virginia port named Yorktown. What happens next has not come before in the war. All the pieces fall into place for Washington, one after the other. The French dispatch a fleet north from the Caribbean. Washington marches his army south, while British General Henry Clinton chooses to keep his men protecting New York. All roads now lead to Yorktown and an assault on Cornwallis. For 11 days, the Americans and French lay siege to the city, tightening the noose around the British army. Surrounded, cut off, and unsupported, it is only a matter of time until the British supplies run out, until they must yield and surrender. For all practical purposes, the war is now over. Now, seven and a half years later, the victorious general who led his nation's soldiers on the battlefield, and two years later, its politicians through a constitutional convention, is about to begin the third act of his remarkable revolutionary life. As his coat finally brings him to the outskirts of New York City, George Washington will, in a matter of days, become President Washington.
April 23, 1789. George Washington enters the eighth and final day of his journey across many of the American states. A journey to the city of New York, where he will be sworn in as the country's first president. If there was ever a question in Washington's mind of the admiration the young nation has for him, this ride serves as testament to his fame. The newspapers of the era printed George Washington's route. There was no television at that time. There was no CNN, no radio. But the newspapers were read by everybody. So the entire country knew where he was going and what time. The highways are filled with people who have ridden days just to see him. They bring their grandchildren so that their grandchildren can tell their grandchildren to tell their grandchildren they actually saw George Washington, this great national hero. It is a much-deserved hero's welcome for the former commander-in-chief and soon-to-be leader of the new nation. A nation that won a war, but still has a long road to travel. In 1789, the new United States is an extraordinarily energetic, diverse, um, but also unstable place. It's a turbulent time in the country. People are apprehensive about the future. All the soldiers, all the gallant, brave young men of the war, 240,000 of them fought in the revolution. But there aren't 240,000 jobs for them when they go home. A lot of them are unemployed. Politically, the country is a mess. The very ideals that set the country ablaze and drove her to revolution, individual liberty, representative government, freedom, are no longer just lofty goals. They are being put into practice across the land. People seem to think that democracy means that everybody should govern. Maybe they should not. Pennsylvania has over 400 people in its state legislature. If you put 12 politicians in a room, it's hard to get anything done. Put 400 in a room. There is no one man that can hold the country together, except him. In defeating the British, America has won her independence, and under Washington's guidance, she must now become a winning nation. But the war for independence has left many losers in its wake. Britain has lost her colonies, a crushing blow to the empire. But somewhat surprisingly, it is America's closest ally, France, that suffers the most. The French are kind of left holding the bag in this conflict. The French um, aid for the, con for the American war has generally been estimated at something like $13 billion in today's dollars. We wouldn't have had any uniforms, we wouldn't have had any munitions without the French. But from the French point of view, um, they are bankrupted by our war. And of course it will have disastrous consequences for them. France in 1789, bankrupt and weakened, is hit by an even greater wave as the democratic earthquake that ripped the American colonies for Britain hits France's shores with a vengeance. Peasants and commoners alike rise up against the monarchy. Tearing down centuries of feudal rule, the French people hold their own revolution. Back in the colonies, restoring peace in the wake of a wrenching war, is first and foremost in Washington's mind. In a war between brothers, where people have been forced to take sides, those who chose to remain with the crown, the loyalists, have to come to grips with their loss. And many are still on American soil. It does take several years for the loyalists who stay in the newly established United States to be reincorporated as members of the society. But one of the things you don't see in this country is a massive retaliation against the Loyalists. And that is due to the nature of the American Revolution and to its leadership. This is the country Washington will have to govern, a country in need of peace between Loyalists and Patriots a country where many African Americans, participants in the struggle for national independence, find themselves still in the bonds of slavery. Where American Indians, 
many who sided with the Patriot cause find themselves forced out of the national dialogue. It is a complicated picture indeed. Nobody had created a republic that was this big geographically or contained so many different types of people. It, it really threw the rules of what a democracy, what a republic could be out the window and said, we're gonna change all of that. The final day of George Washington's journey nears its end. He makes one final crossing, leaving New Jersey on a barge that carries him to the city of New York. Alongside his barge is a barge full of continental soldiers. In another barge is a choir of men and women. And he notices that the old standard, God save the king, has now been translated into God save George Washington. He had considered himself the father of the army. The next logical step to him would be to be the father of his country. The inauguration of George Washington, the great hero of the revolution, is just days away. George Washington, the father of the American army, is about to assume a new role as the father of America, the first president of the United States. It is April 30th, 1789, and today he will be sworn in at New York City's Federal Hall, the final step in his long journey, a journey no other man has known. It's important to remember that the American presidency and this constitution is a innovation that comes out of this period. No one quite knows what the role is. It's not, a, it's not a monarch, it's not a king, it's something new, so it has to be invented. At Federal Hall, Washington visits the chamber of the newly created Congress. Massachusetts firebrand John Adams is vice president at his side. It is a day for celebration, a day for ceremony, every ceremonial detail must be created from scratch. Even how to swear in a president. In the five days prior to the inauguration, Congress had battled back and forth. Should the president be sworn in inside? Should he be sworn in outside? Everything that Congress did, and President-elect Washington did, was precedent setting. And they knew that, and he knew that. In the end, George Washington himself makes the decision. He will be sworn in outside, out among the American people. April 30th, 1789, America's first inauguration. George Washington takes his position on the balcony at Federal Hall. Thousands look on. Months of planning have led to this moment, though there is one small detail that has been overlooked. In all the planning, they forgot to get a Bible. At the last minute, somebody runs two blocks to a fraternal organization and borrows their Bible to tell them George Washington is going to be sworn in on it. With everything now in place, the ceremony begins. A revolution that began with self-evident truths has given birth to a constitution and a leader to preserve, protect, and defend it. He takes the oath of office, and as he ends it, adding himself, in a confident voice says, so help me God. Justice Livingston turns to the crowd and says, long live George Washington, the President of the United States. The crowd just roars. George Washington takes his place in history. And although some wanted him to have a grand title, Washington, ever the Virginia gentleman, insists on being called simply Mr. President.
no one knew whether this was going to work. There are observers speculating that just give them a few years, they're going to be tearing each other apart. Many people at that time said that the war did not end the revolution. The revolution ends with new democratic government, this great experiment in the world. The inauguration of George Washington was not the end of the story. It was just the start of the story. Twenty-five thousand gave their lives for liberty. And long after the heroes of the revolution came home, others took their place in history. John Adams, the great firebrand of the revolution, became the second president of the United States. He died, somewhat fittingly, on Independence Day, July 4th, 1826, reportedly saying, Thomas Jefferson survives. But that was not the case. Five hours earlier on that same day, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, whose Louisiana purchase doubled the size of America with a single stroke, died at the age of 83 at his home, Monticello. Benjamin Franklin, the man who delivered the French to the American cause, withdraws from public life in 1788 due to ill health and dies two years later at the age of 84. 20,000 people attend the funeral of the man who tamed lightning. British Commander-in-Chief Henry Clinton returned to England after the crushing loss at Yorktown, where he received a very cool reception. He spent the last years of his life compiling his complete memoirs, a vain effort to vindicate himself for losing the war. Britain's King George III, never able to crush the American rebels, went mad and was deemed mentally unfit to rule for the final decade of his reign. Benedict Arnold, the Connecticut-born Yankee and America's greatest traitor, landed in London after the war, where he failed as a businessman. He died a broken man at the age of 60, suffering one final slight. Arnold was buried without military honors in a grave mistakenly marked with another man's name. Frederick William Augustus Heinrich Ferdinand Baron von Steuben, the man who almost single-handedly whipped Washington's army into shape over the winter at Valley Forge, was rewarded for his efforts with 16,000 acres of land in Upper New York State. He died there a bachelor in 1794. Nathaniel Green, the Rhode Island Quaker and George Washington's favorite general, never got to see the swearing in of his old commander. He died of sunstroke in 1786 while on a plantation in Georgia. George Washington served as President of the United States for two terms, refusing to accept a third. He returned to his beloved Mount Vernon home in 1797, finally leaving his life of service behind him. He died just two years later, at the age of 67. In one final act for her ever private husband, Martha Washington burned their personal letters written throughout the war. A record of a man and a war, forever lost to time. The American Revolution, a colonial rebellion, a revolution of ideas, 
revolution between brothers. A revolution for independence. <laughs>